Raincoat is the newest IP by the Danganronpa creators. They drove that home in the promotional material, but if they hadn't, just glancing at the game's art, listening to the music, or reading the dialogue would have revealed that the Danganronpa team is behind this game. This time, the similarities are not just on the surface. The whole Danganronpa skeleton was repurposed, and the little discussion of scene revolves around whether this is just an uninspired Danganronpa copy or more than that. I'm not personally interested in taking that approach. In this video, I'll talk about Raincoat trying not to draw constant parallels with Danganronpa because you don't need a kinai for that. We have an amnesiac character who will be insulted for being too plain while he cracks every mystery in his path, sidekicks with a talent that get the spotlight at one point in the game and then fade back into irrelevance, a sociopathic mascot that loves mystery, the same structure of five individual cases that build towards a final overarching one, and the same structure within the chapters with some roaming around, stumbling upon a murder investigation, and solving the whole case in a big, climactic face-off. So many things are shamelessly borrowed from Danganronpa. All the minigames are reskin versions of Danganronpa minigames, and many plot points, like the culprits being executed after they have been exposed, come back. It's their own formula and it's worked well in the past. I don't mind that they ripped it straight off. It's the vast amount of steps backward and baffling decisions that compel me to make this video. The Danganronpa game slowly escalated in complexity, stakes and scale. They were mindless fun that you could enjoy if you suspended your disbelief. Here, they clearly wanted to make a game that caters to the same audience, and the introductory chapter, despite forcing you to suspend your disbelief immediately, made me think that the game would aim to subvert my expectations and throw twists at me if I took anything for granted. That was a very mistaken expectation. Some problems with this game are so apparent that I can get to them right away. You can see through Raincoat almost every step of the way. In the first chapters, everything is so sluggish and seemingly designed to waste the player's time that it was genuinely difficult to play. Characters beat around the bush for every plot point and repeat information over and over, no matter how simple. The fastest text speed is slower than other games' slowest speed. The game doesn't let you mash through text when it's repeating something for the fifth time because there are coded pauses in between lines. I really considered dropping the game at first because there was nothing gripping me, it was a chore to play, and very few revelations felt rewarding. The reason I'm making this video is that I want to bring out my perspective on how the game squanders its potential, and while these issues are in your face the whole game, they don't even scratch the surface of everything I want to unpack. I seek out these mystery games because they really appeal to me. The ingredients are all there for a really engaging experience, and while this is not the first time I'm left frustrated about what could have been, it may be the worst offender. After the experience the staff gathered with the Danganronpa series and the clearly higher budget they had this time, some of the pitfalls this game falls into are very difficult to justify. Spike Chunsoft is asking for feedback on a future installment, so if my frustrations resonate with some other people, maybe there is hope for straying this franchise away from the, in my opinion, misguided approach this game takes. I'll make it clear now that this video will touch on major spoilers right from the beginning, it's gonna be an in-depth overview of the whole game. If you haven't played the game, I encourage you to stop watching. Raincoat will be a worthwhile experience for many, especially those really fond of the Danganronpa series. This video is meant to be watched by people who have played the game and would like to hear me rant about the many things that made me want to sigh or pull out my hair while playing, not without also bringing to light the stuff the game gets right. Before getting into it, I have to mention a few low-hanging fruit complaints. The volume control is a complete mess. Some lines are entirely inaudible behind the music, notoriously in the case overview, and others are far too loud. There is an oh voice line that jump scared me every single time it played. The localization has a significant amount of formatting errors, there are times when the lip sync goes completely out the window, and sometimes the backlog button just stops working. Most importantly, the game runs terribly. The pace is constantly marred by huge loading screens, FPS chug all the time, and character models disappear the moment you slightly step away from them. For some bizarre reason, this is released as a Switch exclusive and it doesn't do the game any favors. I don't think this is a deal breaker, but the way these hiccups slow the game down during the already slow-paced sections turn the experience into a real test of patience. Technical limitations are probably why the game's skip function gives a speed boost just about as significant as Mario Kart 8's star, and why the game turned into 30 hours that could have easily been condensed into 20. Yet, despite how sluggish everything feels, very few parts of the game don't also feel half-baked or rushed, which leads to a surreal pace very unique to this game. I experienced all of these issues at launch and can't speak for whether patches remedied them, but based on the patch notes, it doesn't seem like it. With that said, the content could easily outshine poor performance in a game of this nature.
The introductory chapter has a clear mission, to leave an impression on you. It introduces the characters you think will be the main cast, only to kill them right away, and hits you with a bizarre twist when things are starting to fall into place. It was responsible for making me think that the whole game would go out of its way to play on your expectations, and that every chapter would have an out there breakthrough twist to look forward to. It's a 5 hour long tutorial where you never really feel in control. If you've played Danganronpa, it might feel surreal at first, until you're able to shake off the feeling that you're playing a parallel universe's Danganronpa. I think, though, that in the bigger picture, there is a significant difference between both franchises that I want to establish before looking at things in more detail. If you analyze an individual case in Danganronpa, chances are you'll spot plot holes and contrivances, but the games offer more than just murder mysteries to unravel. In those games, a lot of the engagement comes from seeing the characters battling out in a scuffed, desperate debate, confronting the culprits, understanding their motives, slowly seeing the cast decrease in number, and getting closer to uncovering the overarching mystery piece by piece. To the point that if you point out a detail in an individual case that doesn't really make sense, it may be seen as nitpicky. This isn't the case in Raincode. Here, the emphasis is very much placed on the individual mysteries. Whichever companion is with you rarely enhances the scene. There is no talking things out with the cast when it matters, no real culprit face-offs, no way in which many of the mysteries contribute to a grander scheme. So the game relies on how the individual murder mysteries were conceived and carried out. That's why the way they fall apart is a much bigger scene than in Danganronpa, and poking holes at them should no longer be considered nitpicking with how much the game spends on every little detail. So the game starts and you're shown your new inoffensive amnesiac protagonist. His inner dialogue says that Yuma sounds right as his name, but since we have knowledge from the end of the game, we know he's number one and that he has the largest brain on earth. This is part of his plan to erase his own memories and reach a mysterious city named Kanai Ward with the power of a death god. He leaves a note with the name Yuma to trick himself into believing that's his identity, and a train ticket to Kanai Ward to die on the way. Because what else would happen? Instead of reaching Kanai Ward first and erasing his memories there, he makes his amnesiac self take an extremely dangerous trip that he only survives by pure luck. Either way, you board the train on time and meet the other detectives who were deployed to the same location. I will briefly narrate the events and then give my perspective on why I believe this case falls apart in multiple ways if you look any deeper than the surface. Everyone was told that five detectives would board the train, but they knew nothing about the trainee you exchanged identities with, so since there are six of you in total, they considered that one of you may be a traitor. Something that irks me a bit is the way they handle the protagonist Amnesia. I know he's technically not called Yuma, but I'll refer to him as that to make things easy. He remembers nothing related to his identity but has knowledge about the real world and things he learned, so as number one, he should know what the WDO and Amaterasu are just about as much as he knows what a train is, but he claims not to know any relevant information. Eventually, you start to feel ill, and Zilch, this chapter's culprit, leads Yume to the infirmary, weirdly enough forgetting that the door is locked. The reason why it's locked is never explained, and it's especially weird considering the lock seems to be an inner latch. Yuma is forced to go to the bathroom instead and loses consciousness. During the two hours that he's out, Zilch makes everyone else drink drug beverages and sets their bodies on fire throughout the train as a plot to kill all the master detectives before they reach Kanai Ward, framing Yuma as the only possible culprit. He goes to Karwan's infirmary, which isn't locked anymore or he unlocks it. It's close to where Yuma is sleeping, and when he hears him waking up, he releases smoke in the infirmary to create the illusion that he burned up right then and there. Yuma wakes up, meets his personal death god called Shinigami, notices the smoke in the infirmary, and while he scrambles to open up the door, Zilch swaps places with one of the bodies he killed and hides under the bed. After Yuma fails to spot him, Yuma steps into car number 2, and the train's automatic system detaches car number 1 from the rest of the train. While cars 2-4 to four are in a tunnel, Yuma finds 3 more corpses, and before stepping in what he believes will be car number 5, Car number 1, which went around the tunnel, sticks to car number 4 and creates the illusion that it's a whole new car. Yuma is shown the same corpse again without realizing that it's the first one he found, and he's led to believe that he found 5 corpses, meaning that everyone else is dead, when in reality Zilch is still alive. He knows two facts. One, no one else was on the train before he fell unconscious because one of the detective's abilities confirmed it when they were still alive. And two, the train never stopped. So, unless someone committed suicide or there was an accident, the crime seems like an impossibility because every single person died, but the game never acknowledges a very simple alternate explanation. 
The killer could have just brought a corpse into the train before it departed. It didn't have a pulse at the life reading moment. They burned it to hide its identity and then hid themselves in one of the locked cabins. Even though this simple possibility is never explored, it would have been pretty dull. The actual solution, that car number one detached from the train and became car number five, is far cooler, but it should go without saying that it forces you to suspend your disbelief right away. It's a precedent that shows the game is willing to be ridiculous in favor of entertainment, but if you intend to scrutinize it seriously, it will fall apart entirely. I'll get to the reason why I say that, as well as to whether it's a real problem, but first I'll keep going chronologically. After discovering the final body, which is actually the first one, the train reaches its destination, and peacekeepers, the city's police force, raid the train and accuse Yuma of being the only possible culprit since everyone else is dead. They also reveal a bizarre piece of information, that every person you found died from fire, as if they could realistically determine that in 5 minutes. The game presents it as information you should work with, which is eventually used to hard confirm that everyone died from fire and to disregard any other possible cause of death. This is one of the many occasions where the game gives you evidence to work with that was in no way realistically confirmed. The peacekeepers could easily be lying and couldn't have done a rigorous autopsy. This time it's forgivable enough, but there are instances later in the game where this practice becomes ridiculous. While in a pinch, Shinigami opens up the portal to the first mystery labyrinth, where you use all the clues you gather to slowly unravel the mystery. It's this game's form of class trials, and there is a lot I'd like to say about the format. But this is just a tutorial level, and I was okay with being guided around first before coming to conclusions about what they did to class trials. You still point out contradictions and nearly every old minigame is shoehorned in, but things are different enough to warrant a section about the format once we've gone through a few. I get that this is the introductory labyrinth, but you have to go through so many tutorials and elementary school level explanations before it gets anywhere. The complexity is fairly low, and eventually the answers are blatantly given to you when the time is right with a prompt that spoon fits you the card trick. But I thought the system showed some promise, and I appreciated that the tutorial killed half the characters in the cover art and then pulled a bizarre trick. I can't commend the game for that, but the case moves at a snail's speed from start to finish, and like I said earlier, the focus is very much placed on the mysterious events and the frenetic spectacle in the labyrinth. So far, there is not a lot of character chemistry or banter to hold onto. The meat is very much the mystery itself, which is why the way it falls apart if you try to level with the game damages it more than it would in Danganronpa, where the intricacies of the individual mysteries were a more balanced out part of the appeal even in the first chapters. It's to be expected that there is no mention of how ridiculous the card trick is, because there is no way the game would get out of this one if it brought attention to it. The trick is automated and needs to be perfectly synced. Yuma needs to wake up in time. The first car needs to detach from the rest of the train after Yuma has inspected the first body and moved on to the second car. If he happened to inspect the crime scene for longer or passed out again before the tunnel, the trick would fail. Then, it relies on him taking his sweet time through the train and not trying to reach the fifth car before the first car goes around the tunnel. And if for any reason he happened to want to take another look at the first body, he would notice that car 1 is no longer there. Everything needs to play out with unrealistic precision for the intended illusion, with nothing guiding Yuma. What if he rushed through the train instead of stopping to examine every crime scene along the way? The perfect prediction of Yuma's actions is exacerbated when the game says that Zilch didn't intend to use him as the scapegoat initially. He chose Yuma because he got knocked out when he drank the coffee, turning him into the best target. They assumed that this trick would work on anyone, and there is no mention of how incredibly fortunate the culprit was for everything to play out perfectly. The game does bring to light other fortunate parts of the plan, like the fact that Zilch took the risk of hiding under the bed in the infirmary, because he knows it can get away with that much, but making Yuma figure out the card trick without commenting on how lucky the killer got is pretty disingenuous. That's not the reason why I can't come to terms with this chapter. While I wish the game was more self-aware about its own plot, I'm all for crazy tricks that you would only see in a game like this. Sure, there are some flimsy details to poke at, like Yuma seeing Zilch through the door in perfect condition when seconds later he's supposedly completely burned. The fact that Zilch would likely pass out from the smoke, and none of the surroundings around the corpses being burned when many things, like the carpet itself, look like they would easily catch on fire. I'll sound nitpicky, but this map threw me for a loop, because if one of these four nodes is the train's starting point and this tunnel is the time it took Yuma to investigate the corpses, then there is no room for him to have been unconscious for two hours. Also, there being a blackout when the car disengages is a bit strange considering its intended behavior, but these aren't the points I want to put emphasis on. There are a couple big picture details that make this case truly come to pieces and so I cannot view it as anything more than a huge mess. 
You might have asked yourself something that the game vaguely touches on with special care. Why did the culprit not just put poison in the beverages instead? They wanted to kill every detective going to Kanai Ward. So why go to the lengths of framing one of the detectives, in this case Yuma, and killing all the others instead of cleaning them all out? The game is able to get away with this only because it's the tutorial and you don't know how things will work, which I'm kinda bitter about. The Peacekeeper's report was a lie, but they have no reason to do that. If they wanted to set you up as the culprit, they would be raising questions by fabricating reports. If you've played the rest of the game, you know that's BS. The Peacekeepers constantly fabricate evidence and actively ignore logic to go with their narrative, gunning down or arresting anyone who questions them. The way this chapter plays out directly contradicts how the Peacekeepers act the rest of the game, just remember what happens in chapter 2. In reality, they would have killed every passenger, stopped the train and covered the logs, or they would have protected the hitman's identity when the train reached its destination with everyone dead, or they would have bombed the whole train. There is plenty of evidence throughout the whole game to know that they would have never bothered devising this involved plan, leaving one of the detectives alive and framing them just to keep evidence consistent. Now, when the train reaches Kanai Ward, it attaches to a prepared car 1 so that the total number of cars ends up being 5. But why? Is it done to trick anyone who was there during the arrest? No, because they would know that the first car was always there. Is it done to trick anyone who never went to the station? Is it done just to keep things consistent with the events they intend to report, despite the fact that they falsify evidence in front of everyone the whole game? And despite the fact that when the mystery labyrinth is solved and the culprit dies, the peacekeepers ignore that their plan failed and still intend to arrest Yuma with no longer any consistent evidence? Because this is the second big picture way the case falls apart. The car is prepared in advance to trick Yuma. Everything is devised to trick Yuma, the one person there is no need to trick. And when I say everything, I'm including the body swap in the infirmary and the car swap. It's a trick that only works in Yuma, the person intended to be arrested and silenced. The peacekeepers are in cahoots with Zilch. They intended to retrieve the living Zilch out of the cabin where he was hiding. So if all he had done had been hide in the cabin, with no body swapping tricks or car swapping tricks, the train would have reached the destination, Yuma would have been unable to find the culprit, the peacekeepers would have escorted Zilch out of the cabin like they intended to do anyway and accused Yuma of being the only possible culprit with no elaborate tricks. In the real plan, Afix's corpse is repurposed and made to look like a fifth body, but that's only in the eyes of Yuma. When the peacekeepers raid the train, there are only four corpses, so it goes without saying that they were gonna lie and say they found five. It's why there is zero need to make Yuma think he found a non-existent fifth corpse and it should have been as simple as making Zilch hide in one of the cabins and then making the peacekeepers say that they found him dead like in the original plan. In the same vein, Zilch makes it look like he's been stabbed when he's about to burn to make it look like he's already dead, but this is as pointless as everything else. There is no reason to make Yuma think that he was already dead. Tricking the person you're falsifying evidence to frame is ridiculous, and to make things worse, the peacekeepers say that all the bodies died from fire, which directly clashes with the knife. So, I believe that everything I said is fair, but even if needlessly complex and extremely reliant on luck, it's still a solid plan to exterminate the detectives and abuse your power as an authority if you must ditch the original trick, right? Well, there is a third big picture way the plan falls apart, and it's one that the game completely brushes off. In the final chapter, Makoto says that the real Yuma followed the protagonist into the train and reached Kanai Ward with it. The game even shows you this in a mysterious cutscene at the end of chapter 0. So, there was a very simple way for the detectives to reach Kanai Ward after all. If any of them had simply been in the fifth car when it departed, they could have reached Kanai Ward completely safely. Considering how the game makes a huge deal out of the measures Amaterasu take to eliminate the intruders, and the fact that Zilch wasn't keeping track of whether the missing sixth person, Yuma, was in the fifth car, it turns out that if he or anyone else happened to be in it when the train departed, they would have reached Kanai Ward alive and well. It may seem like I'm overanalyzing things. Some people may be put off by hearing me dissect a mystery that may not be designed to be dissected, but these are all points that I thought of on my first playthrough. The mystery was falling apart as I was playing it, and for a game that wants to put so much focus on the details of the cases, I wouldn't be so quick to excuse the way things fall apart. I've played many mystery games and always enjoyed breaking things down on my own, and this one gave me enough things to want to vent about to make a comprehensive video about it. But for continuing, I'll mention a few disclaimers. I understand that a lot of people like this game and may be really passionate about it, sometimes even despite the fact that not everything is logically sound. 
that's fine and with this video I'm just trying to lay out my personal discontent with different aspects of the game. I'm aware that my priorities with a game like this won't be everyone else's. Secondly, I don't claim to have the absolute truth about anything I say, so if at any point I get some detail wrong or you think there is an explanation for something that I poke a hole in, feel free to correct me. All that said, Chapter Zero is a respectable introduction. A murder mystery on a train is always gripping, the mood isn't so bad, and it tries to do something cool despite how much you have to suspend your disbelief for it. It uses a common trope, burning a corpse to hide its identity, puts a spin on it with a car swap, and even uses it to hide a late game twist. It's conceptually similar to a case from Danganronpa 1 and it takes its sweet time to get going, but it's an introduction that shows some potential. The mystery labyrinth is a neat concept that has a lot of room to improve. Now you find yourself in an unknown place shrouded in secrecy and there is also plenty of room for the game to subvert your expectations again. The villain is just a maniacally evil fat guy who I doubt anyone even notices doesn't appear again, and while Yuma and Shinigami start off having a bit of a stilted chemistry, there is also plenty of time to develop that. Next, the game introduces Yako in a scene that I thought made him look of way higher standing than he really is, and the peacekeepers let you off the hook, first time of many. From this point on, you're in Kanai Ward, and the game becomes a waiting room until they reveal what bizarre explanation they come up with for the unending rain. Admittedly, I wanted this game to derail. Since the game had immediately prompted me to suspend my disbelief and was willing to pull absurd tricks, I wanted it to be a non-stop plot of them, and if the tutorial went this deep off the rails, just imagine what's coming next. The fact that they call the tutorial chapter Chapter Zero suggests that it's not a fully fledged chapter like the ones to come later, and that it's merely the presentation of the mechanics. So, in Chapter One, you expect the game to take the reins and showcase the potential of what they have come up with. To my frustration, the start was not any faster than the 5 hour long tutorial. The game places you in a big and mysterious city, but there is no feeling of release yet because your speed is locked to the slowest I've ever seen and there are invisible walls everywhere. This part is technically labeled as the prologue, so it seems there is still a bit more build up to digest before getting into the action. Yaku gives you a lecture on the dangers of the city and Amaterasu's power, and you're introduced to the other master detectives who managed to survive. This is where Yume is told that he's a trainee detective, and where a phony number one entrusts the agency with solving Kane Ward's ultimate secret. Thinking back, there are some nice pieces of foreshadowing with Shinigami saying that she's not impressed with number one since she knows he's a fake, and I suspect the fact that Yuma's cooking is terrible may be a hint that the profile you read wasn't his. Now you get into the real chapter one. The game is finally gonna start, but not so fast. First, you've gotta run some errands and deal with more invisible walls. The slowest walking speed in video games, and the first of many soulless fetch quests the game offers is optional material. I don't mind that the game wants to slowly build a world and get you to know the characters, but the text, movement, loading screens, everything is so slow that it can get irritating. You're introduced to the side quests you can take on during the game, marked with green on the map, which is one of the most baffling ways the game wastes more of your time with completely substanceless content. They're framed as detective missions you can accept from NPCs, like solving a kidnapping case or finding a thief, but all they make you do is go to the question marks that appear on the map until the case is solved. There is never anything climactic or interesting in them, and the most they offer is hammering down on the idea that you're in a crime-filled location. To rub salt in the wound, there is no detective work or shortcuts you can take to clear them. As an example, the first quest, which has you deliver a book to Vivian, wants you to talk to a couple NPCs marked on the map who will give you hints as to where the bookstore is. But if you find the bookstore before talking to the NPCs, the clerk tells you that they're closed, so you need to waste as much time as possible talking to every highlighted NPC in order to find the bookstore that you already found. It doesn't help that, the day after being instructed to solve some big international secret, these detectives' approach is to roam aimlessly, hoping some intel drops from the sky. Instead, you instantly stumble upon a murder case separate from what you're investigating. Here is where it starts to become apparent that you will deal with a case independent of the overarching plot and unrelated to the main cast of characters. It's not as appealing of an approach as every case being interconnected and directly relating to a cast established at the start, but if the cases were good, that would hardly be a problem. Now, I'm not gonna beat around the bush or reserve my thoughts for later. This is one of the worst detective cases I've ever seen, and it almost made me drop the game. I don't know if I've ever experienced a murder mystery so transparent, plain and asinine as this one, but what had me on the brink of dropping the game was the seven hours of utter slog that it's cramped into. 
The game doubles down on the slow pace from chapter 0 and refuses to take more than one step every half an hour. There was no point in this chapter where I didn't feel like the game was treating me like a toddler being tested for basic cognitive abilities. There are footprints below the window, where the culprit clearly escaped from, but is it a coincidence? As if spending 20 minutes investigating a scene where the culprit obviously escaped from a window isn't enough, later you also gotta spend 20 minutes solving that same scene where the culprit clearly escaped from a window, and when it's revealed that the culprit escaped from the window, the game showers you with confetti for having reached such a brilliant deduction. I will tackle things in detail like I did for Chapter Zero, but this case really killed my spirits. You stumble upon a murder in a clock tower and decide to investigate the case, but before you can even begin the investigation, you've got to do a pre-investigation and talk to NPCs marked on the map who fill you in on what's going on. One of them tells you that this is the fourth killing of a serial killer who goes by the name Nailman and kills anyone you leave the name of in a forest. The first death happened six months ago, and all the deaths were found in locked rooms. It's honestly an interesting premise, and locked rooms are always fun, or at least I would have said that before playing this game. Six loading screens later, you're back at the clock tower and as you're about to get arrested for intruding, Halara knocks out the peacekeepers bugging you and the son of the arrested man convinces you to prove his dad's innocence. I don't have a strong opinion on Halara. The trope of being overly badass and distant is pretty overdone, but I found them tolerable, although the quirk, you need to back up and prove your resolve with money, is so idiotic that I remember being annoyed by the way the game portrays it as a coherent personality trait. Anyway, for now, Halara walks away and you enter the first crime scene alone. The blood is pink. I don't know if people instantly put together that Yuma's blood was red in the train, but that was very fresh in my mind, so the moment I saw the pink blood, I figured there was something funny going on. My first thought was that there would be a twist at the end of the game where Yuma isn't actually human, which is why his blood was red. But it's actually the complete opposite. Yuma is the human and the pink blood belongs to non-humans. So why did I not think about that possibility? Well, because the game does a horrible job at foreshadowing it. I immediately realized that the blood color didn't match and was on the lookout for subtle mentions of it. And according to the game, there is one right here. In Chapter 5, the game says that in Yuma's reaction upon discovering the first body, he addressed the blood being pink. But the execution is so poor that I would have never interpreted it like that despite being on the lookout for it. He doesn't mention it, Shinigami doesn't mention it, but the game acts like it was addressed and you just didn't realize it at the time. Which, at least in the English version, is very forced. Having said that, using the pink blood from Danganronpa as a relevant plot point is pretty funny, and I spent the whole game hoping they would do it. Anyway, here's where the fun starts. Strap in for a 3 hour long investigation featuring the mystery genre's greatest hits, beginning with the strongest contender of them all. The locked room where the window locks itself. I don't know if I've ever seen a bigger attempt at gaslighting than this game trying to convince me that this is a locked room. All over the chapter, I kept imagining the killer going around the city looking for ideal locked room conditions. Window that locks automatically for some inexplicable reason. Rusty outer keyhole so no key can be inserted. Prime locked room conditions found. I don't think there is going to be anyone who will look at this room and not come to the conclusion that there is no mystery associated with it. The dilemma that locked rooms bring is how the room was locked, so you cannot keep saying, oh, the window was locked from the inside, the moment you see that closing the window automatically locks it. The killer simply locked the room and then used the rope to escape from the window. But the game fails to even mention that possibility when you inspect the room, and you leave without drawing any conclusions. It's so insanely basic that I remember being at a loss. The culprit jumps out of the window, the window locks itself, the culprit's footprints are left behind unless it's a coincidence, and they are not sneakers, but they could be loafers, and the boy says that his dad usually wears sneakers and almost never loafers. Hmm. I figured this chapter would have some twist like chapter zero, so part of me thought that the simplicity was bait, but no. The only thing you're missing is the ladder formation the killer uses to descend with the rope, which admittedly is a cool detail, but having to cut every step as you go down would give anyone a lot of time to see you and it would definitely be possible to jump down using the rope around the nails without having to shape it as a ladder. After investigating the clock tower and still being at a loss about what could have possibly happened, you ask Clara for help, who accepts to follow you around but refuses to help a single time. God forbid anyone mentions the possibility that the killer escaped through the vent. But first you go to the church. Actually, first you go to the submarine to ask where the church is, where some guy threatens Yako with killing him in three hours. Now you go to the church where the suspects line up before you and you gotta deduce who's the culprit based on hard logic. We're talking about memorable and striking characters such as Nun and 
the worshipper. This is a big misstep by the chapter. Presenting the potential culprits partway through the investigation and treating them as pawns in a simple logic game makes it so that there is zero attachment to any of it. You're no longer exposing a character you've interacted with the whole game and understanding what drove them to commit the crime. That part is all relegated to a dry logic game about which of the four possible suspects you know nothing about could have committed the crime. And to make it worse, it's horribly done. To start with, why are the only possible culprits these four people at the church? In the mystery labyrinth, the game makes the point that it can only be one of them because the rope, which was used to escape from the clock tower, was burnt in the incinerator that only clergy members have access to. Basically, Yuma perfectly deduces that the rope must have been shaped into a ladder, which the killer disposed of in a private incinerator that couldn't burn a simple rope. And Servant, who was passing by, for some crazy reason decided to take out a rope that was being burned, somehow managed to discern what it was shaped into, didn't see the shoes that the killer had also burned, and brought it up to Yuma. I doubt I have to mention how contrived this is, but to top things off, when Yuma comes to the conclusion that the rope from the incinerator must have been the one used in the clock tower, he also concludes that only someone with access to the incinerator could have disposed of it. That's these three people, but the game never makes that clear. It never says that these are the only people with the required authority to access the incinerator. So for all you know, an unknown character could be the killer. But that's not all, because Servant, who told you about the rope, is still treated as a suspect despite the fact that he revealed what the killer supposedly wanted to conceal. And who's this guy? He's a worshipper who doesn't actually have access to the incinerator. So why does the game treat him as a suspect? Well, because that's your job. You need to discard him based on that logic. And unfortunately, the game does a terrible job at making it clear that the worshipper couldn't have access to the incinerator. When Servan tells you about the rope he found, he states that only clergy can access the incinerator. Guess who's called a clergy member? This guy right here. He was the first witness in the clock tower murder, and the peacekeepers wrote about him in their report, saying, first on the scene, clergy member and several peacekeepers. So the guy who's not actually a clergy member is regarded as a clergy member, which added to the fact that the game still considers him a suspect at the end really confused me. Now, to be fair, I read again what he says the first time you talk to him, and he clarifies that he's not actually a clergy member, but I really think that the game fails to make it clear. Anyway, is that it? Only these three people have incinerator access. Servan can't be the killer because he revealed the rope that the killer tried to burn, so there is two suspects left. This girl has a cast, so it would have been hard for her to climb down the clock tower. Case solved, it's the priest. If only. At this point in the investigation, you come to the conclusion that you must keep searching for hints, so you go investigate the three past crime scenes relating to the nail man. I really need to stress again that this whole investigation is a complete slog and they went overboard making you investigate for rooms. But anyway, maybe the next one will be more interesting. The door was locked and there is a vent. So the killer escaped through the vent. Case solved. That's the summarized version of 20 more minutes of an investigation where the characters don't even consider that the killer might have climbed to the vent because that must be reserved for the labyrinth. What I'll mention is that the vent was unscrewed in the past but screwed again in the present, so I guess I'm supposed to believe that the peacekeeper screwed it again for some reason. Still as lost as ever, you move on to the next locked room, the one from three months ago. A good moment with Halara cannot save this one from being probably the worst one of the bunch. Remember when in Chapter 0 no one mentioned the absurdity of the train swap and the crazy good fortune needed for it to work? Well, here no one bats an eye when Yuma deduces that the killer perfectly threw the key through the door vent, which landed below the corpse that was being held by a string. If they had missed the throw, they couldn't have reopened the door to retry, and again, no one there's mentioned the high improbability of the plan working. The trick with the fish string holding the torso is cool, but yet again, Figuring it out is very trivial, and there is no justification for how long you spend first investigating and then piecing it together in the labyrinth. I'll admit, it's funny to keep listening to Halara assuring you that duplicate keys couldn't have been used for the tricks under any circumstances. Source, trust me. But when I realized there was still another room to investigate, I wanted to cry. You go to the final crime scene, constantly rushed by Halara since you're running short on time. But don't be afraid to accept any more side quests, those have priority. I don't have a lot of problems with this final room. It's definitely made by the same locked room friendly designers who built the auto lock window from the clock tower, in this case deciding to use a different window in the same locked room catalog. But I'll admit the trick in this one, nailing the painting from outside the room, is more interesting than the others. I don't really understand how the painting is supposed to not fall the moment you exert the force to nail the key through it, considering the nail also went through the doll, 
but I'd say this is the only salvageable one out of the four. It's finally time for the second mystery labyrinth. To create some tension, right as you're getting arrested for stepping out of line, Halara brings in the four possible suspects, and you hop into the labyrinth thinking that finding the truth is going to save Yaku when the megaphone guy is evidently not going to budge it. Remember the four rooms you already solved in your head? It's time to actually solve them, and you do so with only facts and airtight logic, such as the boy's dad can't be the culprit because he's afraid of heights. After figuring out the shocking truth that the killer used the rope to escape from the clock tower, the game wants you to solve the other three rooms in your favorite order. The mystery labyrinth format really fails in this section. In the second room, you point at the door, say that the culprit threw the key through the vent, that a string was used to move the body, that the body was held up with a string, that the string was retrieved afterwards, that the string went through the doll, and then you have to recreate everything step by step to make sure you understand something you understood the moment you laid eyes on the room. It's such an involved process to unravel something so basic that the craziness of the labyrinth feels completely flat when there is nothing shocking about what's being revealed. An hour later, you've determined how all the tricks were done. The killer went through the vent in the first room and nailed the key onto the painting in the third room. I do like the idea that solving each individual room gives you a hint to gradually narrow down the pool of suspects, but the execution leaves a lot to be desired. After solving the four rooms, you're ready to expose the culprit, and from this point onward, the meaning of the word logic becomes even more abstract. The four suspects stand before you. Only one of them could be the culprit. Apparently only three people work in the church and have access to the incinerator, so this guy can't be the culprit, he is just here for the ride. I'd like to see how you would have found the culprit if the rope wasn't given to you on a silver platter, meaning that Servant, the hero who narrowed the suspects to just three, can't be the culprit. No, actually it's because he's fat. He couldn't have gone through the vent in room number one, so he's completely out of the question, because it's a known fact that you cannot be skinny and six months later be fat. So it's a tough decision between none and the priest. But remember when, out of nowhere and in the most tilted way possible, Yuma asked the nun if her cast was on her dominant hand. I bet you didn't expect this to come into play. Of course, she couldn't have strangled a bunch of resisting victims with just her non-dominant hand or climbed down with a rope. Wrong again. She simply couldn't have perfectly tossed the key through the door vent because naturally anyone without a cast could. Also, I don't need to say this, but everyone who has a cast was born with it. It's simply inconceivable that even though she never mentioned how long she had the cast for, she broke her arm a week ago or something. She must have 100% had it three months ago, for room number two. It's basically a birthmark. So, the real culprit got on with facts and logic. Not fat, no cast, can't even burn a rope in an incinerator, it's this guy. Okay, even if you assume that all the moon logic used to nail the priest down as the killer made any sense, it's still based on a flawed assumption, which is that all the crimes were committed by the same person. Why does it matter that the killer for room number one couldn't be fat? There is no certainty that the same person was behind room number four, and this is an assumption that's never even questioned. So you accuse the priest of being the killer based on multiple assumptions and logical calamities. I'll repeat, now without any sarcasm, that the game discards the nun as a possible suspect because she has a cast, and you have no idea if she already had it during the old crimes or if it's from two days ago. Doesn't matter because the priest's phantom slips for him and you win. He reveals to being the nail man despite the fact that you got no evidence and your job here is done. No, you wouldn't be spared so easily. We need a twist, just like in Chapter Zero. The labyrinth doesn't end, meaning that the truth goes even deeper. Here is where the game reveals that there is something different about one of the four rooms, and you gotta pick which one it is. The truth is that there is something in each of the rooms that differs from the others, but the game is referring to the cause of death in Room 3 being different. I picked Room 3, but I didn't really know what logic we were working with, because for all I knew, the victim could have hit her head while being strangled, which made her unable to resist. Or maybe the killer dealt the fatal blow from behind and then strangled her to keep in line with the previous murders. I still don't see why the fact that the cause of death differs is such a big deal, but according to the game, it's solid evidence of the murder having been committed by a copycat criminal. Believe me, I really tried to see how one thing points to the other, but this felt like the most random deduction of all time. I get that the labyrinth didn't end, so you must assume that someone else was involved, but concluding that there was a copycat criminal because the cause of death in room 3 doesn't perfectly match is a wild jump. That's not the bad part, though. First of all, Halara assumes that the cause of death was the hit on the victim's head and not the strangulation marks, which doesn't necessarily have to be the case but isn't the worst assumption. It would mean that the killer made the death look like strangulation to be consistent with the previous killings. The cause of death wasn't public information, 
So the only possible suspects are the peacekeepers and the worshipper, who was the only witness in every single crime. So it's the worshipper, case solved again, hope there is some confetti left. He made the death look like strangulation by not actually strangling her and by leaving an obvious fatal blow on the back of the head. Way to go, why not actually strangle her if the goal was to be consistent with the other crimes? Anyway, I'll say it again, that's not the worst part. The worst part is that, once again, everything is founded on flawed logic. You're not cornering the worshipper as the only possible killer, like the game wants you to think. What if the priest had an accomplice, like the nun or anyone in the world, and told him about the modus operandi? Yuma's deduction is based on so many assumptions and plenty of other possibilities are totally ignored. But I'd go so far as to say that's still not the worst part. The worst part is how irrelevant all of this feels. Why does it matter that the third room was committed by someone else? Nothing really changes. You're still accusing a person you know nothing about. There is nothing interesting about it, but the chapter does all it can to keep dragging out. Once you're done stalling for time, you reveal that there was hard evidence against the worshipper all along. This is probably the only time in the whole case where the word evidence is rightfully used. The fact that you saw the spilled paint in Hollar's recreation of the scene means that the worshipper couldn't have been the first witness since he was the one to spill it. So I wonder why the game spends so much time with assumptions disguised as logic before bringing this up. It's also another of the few cool details of the case. It's usually nice when they subtly use character-specific abilities as evidence in these games. The worshipper has no rebuttal, which puts an end to the labyrinth and the case. Not before going through all the locked rooms in excruciating detail once again. I've mentioned my issues with this chapter at length already. It's as locked from beginning to end. There is no satisfaction in solving any of the mysteries. It has nothing interesting, gripping, or compelling, and it squanders the potential of a serial killer who loves locked rooms with throwaway characters you have no attachment to. If you dared examine a particular case in Danganronpa, maybe you would notice that everything hinges on a contrived setup created by the killer that accomplishes nothing other than eventually revealing them as the killer. But at least there was an attempt to make an intriguing set of events. There is nearly nothing to salvage in this one. Everything is played straight and as simple as you think the first time you see it. For being a filler case completely separate from the game's overarching story, it does nothing to stand up for itself and could be completely removed at no loss. If you search Who's the Killer Riddle on YouTube, you'll experience the thrill of this chapter in under 10 minutes, and I'm sure it will be more logically consistent. It's also a perfect precedent to begin to nail down a big issue with this game, which is how predictable most things are. With how easy things are to solve prior to the labyrinths, the slow pace completely wrecks certain sections. This is the worst case in this regard. Every room you're presented with, as well as the culprit, can be effortlessly solved in perfect detail, and I needed to muster all my patience not to give up on the game here. With that said, even though this stands as a very low point of the game, I'm not sure I'd call it the lowest, because there is a certain other chapter brave enough to challenge chapter 1's spot as the worst in the game. For now, you return to the real world, and it turns out that solving the mystery was useless again. The culprits magically die, but you're still about to get arrested before you meet Yomi, the next cartoonish villain who takes the place of the current cartoonish villain. Basically, it goes as follows. The peacekeepers knew everything all along. Even though they hardly investigated the crime scenes, they just knew that the priest was the killer. In the past, Yomi ordered Seth to facilitate donations for the church in exchange for monetary compensation. So they let the priest just keep on killing and eventually arrested the watchmaker. Yomi thinks it would be great trolling if he accused Seth of something he ordered him to do, so he enters the scene with a bike and orders Seth's imprisonment, letting us detectives leave even though he will bomb his next chapter. And it ends. Oh, it's the school chapter. Chapter 2 has a similar laid down start. You do some chores game freak style. The spotlight is immediately placed on the Zuhiko, who will inevitably be the companion this time. You go buy groceries, and are given the choice to do more awful side quests that have you scrambling from loading zone to loading zone. Special shoutouts to the quest that makes you go to every single chapter 1 room one more time, trailing a reporter who ends up dismissing all your information when you finally find him, only for you to go back to the submarine where you discover that they killed the guy who gave you the intel and that he knew all along that he was sending you all over the place for no reason, which he writes on a note before dying. Double special shoutouts to the guy who doesn't know what the detective is despite the fact that they still existed a couple years ago, the cheerful woman you can tell is getting abused after two lines of dialogue, 
the fat guy who can't be the killer because he's fat getting scammed by God, the cameo by the 11037 employee, and the dog with the crazy ear physics. All of these while you start to praise the real start of the game, the bus stations. The game shamelessly repeats a formula that by this point has become obvious. Every chapter, new areas open up, and a new master detective is given focus. I won't claim it's a terrible structure since it gives each chapter its own identity, but it makes the game suffer from predictability, repetitiveness, and a not feeling of abnormality, since all the chapters are structured the same way. There is not a lot of subtlety in play. Most areas are available from the start, but Yuma refuses to go through them until it's time, and characters might as well not exist until the game calls them to the stage. The world design is pretty great, and I enjoyed slowly getting used to the kind of word music as the game adds more context behind the city. But it's hard to ignore the soulless NPCs, dead ends and invisible walls, and choppy performance that hinder the experience the game is trying to build. Either way, this time the game takes less time to get to the point. Shinigami warns you that someone is following you, who you try to bait out. You better hope you're not holding up to walk forward when you get jump scared by a QTE, as you're about to meet Kurumi. She's the city's only informant. What does that mean? You'll never know. But she presents you with the new case you'll get involved with. A homicide that was covered up as a suicide six months ago. Aiko, who was Kurumi's friend, supposedly committed suicide by jumping off their school roof, but Kurumi doesn't trust it. To gather information related to the crime, you seek the Suhiko's help and are forced into a weird time-wasting minigame to spot the right the Suhiko, which you can simply brute force without asking for a single clue. With his help, you enter the only girl's school disguised as a girl, and I gotta say, a strong point of this chapter is how well the music manages to give it a distinct feel. There are a couple songs spammed throughout the chapter that really managed to give it a floaty, melancholic feel, and they were able to get me more engaged than the previous chapters. Unlike in chapter 1, you are immediately presented with the full picture and the relevant characters, and there is a proper build-up toward the first investigation. There are some countersides, like the fact that the school is in a very interesting setting, the premise is similar to a certain Danganronpa case, and Shinigami's antics are more annoying than usual. All she does is insult Kurumi and make fun of Yuma. It's easy to ignore, but it can be grating considering you also have to deal with Asuhiko, who doesn't enhance the chapter in any way. The master detectives are supposed to be the world's top detectives, but the game gets away with making two of them painfully dumb by saying that they have an innate talent that comes in handy in investigations. Desuhiko is the most average visual novel male character with zero detective qualities, but thanks to his ridiculously strong innate ability, he gets to tag along and contribute with nothing but pervy jokes. Either way, like I said, it's not difficult to set these points aside and look at the chapter's good side as far as the foundation and ambience go. When you enter the school, you're immediately brought to the theater, where a play rehearsal will take place, and Kurumi introduces the four girls she suspects could be involved in Aiko's death. Once she's done, the play begins. This whole scene is pretty nicely executed. You patiently wait for something to go wrong until you realize what's gonna happen. But let's not lie to ourselves, there is a big elephant in the room in this chapter, one that already existed in chapter 1 and it works so much against it that the whole experience completely fails to be as poignant as it tries to be. You know Karin killed Aiko. You know the other three girls work together to kill Karin. It's spelled out crystal clear. Am I really walking down the right path? Did I wind up somewhere I'm not meant to be? What's the need for making Yuma literally read Karin's mind before anything even happens to point straight toward her having killed Aiko? To make it even clearer, they say Karin had been acting nervous exactly since Aiko's death six months ago. I'd be shocked if most people's first idea wasn't that Karin killed Aiko and that this was a revenge plot. So many things point to it, and to the fact that the three girls work together to accomplish it. So the whole chapter pretty much boils down to a very long investigation and deduction where the game fails to acknowledge the obvious possibility only for it to end up being the grand reveal. Anyway, let's backtrack a bit. There is still one thing about this chapter that I found unique, and others that left me dumbfounded. It's clear something is going on during the play. The lights go off, one of the girls is seen sneakily approaching the stage, and poison is brought up. One of the wine glasses is supposedly poisoned, both girls shuffle the glasses, and they drink the wine. Immediately, Karin dies. This is a pretty interesting setup, because it seems as if none of the people involved could have known which glass had the poison, and you can immediately jump to many wild theories. After Karin dies, there is another masterful bit of foreshadowing where Desuhiko says, what's up with the blood, instead of asking why it's pink and you're instantly thrown into sudden guitar music with a huge investigation text which didn't really seem fitting. Neither do the casual and composed sentences by Kurumi such as, she was supposed to die in the script, I didn't expect her to actually die though. 
In this kind of surreal part of the investigation, you find out that the poison vial was empty and that the glasses were shuffled legitimately, so deliberately aiming for Karin would have been difficult. Throughout the chapter, Yuma dismisses many times the possibility that maybe the killer didn't care who died, which he often does without any reasoning, but that's something I can ignore. What's harder to ignore is what Kurumi says, that a hidden person couldn't have poisoned the glass during the blackout in the play because, if they were in a hurry, their footsteps would have been heard by everyone. That's a very unfair thing for the game to say, since it's basically what Waruna did. Yuma repeats it in the labyrinth, saying that Yoshiko couldn't have gone up the stage during the blackout because everyone would have heard it. But the truth is even worse. When the lights go out, notice that Karin and Waruna are hugging. During the five seconds the lights are off, Waruna runs to the right edge of the stage, picks up a glass from the floor, puts it under her dress, will get there, and goes back to the center of the stage. So she could do all of that without being heard, but it's unthinkable that anyone else did. I'm just bitter that the game shuts down that possibility because the footsteps would have been heard, and then ignores that Waruna's running in a dress made no noise. By the way, I'll ask, who caused the blackout? Did someone cause it? Was it a scripted part of the play? I don't think it's an intended part of the play because one of the members says that they always count the off time when blackouts happen, so I don't really know what's up with it. I don't think it's made clear, but I'll assume it's automated by the culprit somehow. Anyway, you finish the investigation by noticing that the shuffling could have been seen from the catwalk above, and now comes a scene that completely drove me crazy. The peacekeepers enter the stage with lightsabers and arrest Kurumi for tampering with the wine. During this entire section, they keep talking about who could have poisoned the wine, about whether the wine bottle had poisoned remains, and about whether Kurumi could have poisoned the wine before the play. All of this while completely ignoring that Waruna also drank it. If the wine had been poisoned, Waruna would have died, but there is no mention of something so unbelievably basic. To make things worse, Martina proves that the poison from the chemistry lab was the one used for the crime because, upon opening the lid once, the poison permanently stops having an effect 30 minutes later. And since nothing happens to her when she drinks some of it, it must have been used for the crime, as if it couldn't have been opened days or years in the past. It's one thing if the peacekeepers use broken logic to follow an agenda, but this is the reason why Yuma spends the whole chapter, including the mystery labyrinth, certain that this was the poison used for the crime, just because it didn't affect Martina when in reality there is nothing that confirms it. There is never any test done to verify whether it's the poison that was used, so the premise of the crime is already not even founded on logic. After this comes the most blatant example of the peacekeepers ignoring logic to arrest who they want to arrest. They disregard that Kurumi couldn't have placed the poison before the play since it would have had no effect by the time Karin died, which breaks chapter 0 wide open, like I said earlier. You're brought back to the hall and have the idea to disguise yourself as the three biggest suspects in order to get the most out of your investigation. This is what I was referring to earlier when I said there was something I found unique in this chapter. This method of investigating is very interesting, and I'm a little sad it wasn't used in a more complex mystery where there are different conclusions to draw from each point of view. Sadly, not only is the conclusion to draw in this case very simple, but this part of the investigation is filled with gaslighting attempts equal to the locked room in the clock tower. It doesn't take long before you realize that the three girls had something to do with the crime. Yoshiko with the glass in her locker and being spotted walking up to the stage, Kurana with her lighting job on the catwalk, and Waruna with her actions on stage. During the whole chapter, you sort of expect to figure out how all of these ties to a single truth where a single person did it, because the game seems to not even consider the possibility that they were accomplices despite how in your face it is. Kurana and Waruna think that Yoshiko is the killer. Yoshiku and Kurana think that Waruna is the killer. Yoshiku and Waruna hate Kurana and don't want to talk to her. This is what the game tries to make you believe, but by the way they phrase things, it's extremely clear that they're talking to each other as accomplices, and the way the game tries to spin it as if they're just suspicious of one another is a major reach. I remember thinking that if the game managed to pull that off, that there was a single culprit obfuscated within all the points of view, it would be really impressive and I started to think it might end up being the case solely because of how shamelessly the game sidesteps the accomplice possibility. To give an example, when you disguise as Waruna and talk to Yoshiko, she talks to Waruna as an accomplice, it's seen in the tone and words, clear as day. You handle that poison scene with Karin really well. Everything she says comes across as if they had it all planned, but the game doesn't even consider the possibility, so it made me wonder if it was some weird localization hiccup that was never meant to be interpreted as accomplice talk. There are far too many, though. I will not speak to you, I told you it would be this way. You managed it well. 
You're not supposed to be here. Listen, the peacekeepers are everywhere. Can't you tell I'm trying to blend into the wall? I didn't expect you to bring it up. Just by being here, you're a nuisance. Yuma doesn't interpret a single one of these in the context of being accomplices when it's spelled out in broad daylight. The game refuses to even bring it up as a possibility until way, way later, when it's revealed as some sort of twist, because if it brought it up earlier, everything would be solved. When you consider that they could be accomplices, everything falls into place. Yoshiko brought the poison during the play, Waruna applied it, and Kurana pointed to the poison glass. It's such a simple solution that the game can't even consider the most obvious possibility until the very end because all the tricks would immediately fall. So, despite the cool investigation method, you're just changing appearances to chase a truth that doesn't exist. Every time you change your appearance, there is a 20 second load in the hall. To load what? What is it loading? You reappear in the exact same hall which is already loaded. It's a shame that this section is squandered in such a basic case because I was really on board with it at first. Even the things it wants you to grasp are kinda laid out in your face, like Kurane pointing to the poison glass for Karin to pick it up. There is no deduction to be done on your end, you're just told about it straight up. Something I don't quite get is that a student says that they saw Kurane grabbing Karin's script, which you find in Karin's locker with a note to pick up whichever glass gets hit by the spotlight first. I imagine I'm led to believe that Kurane picked it up to hide it, but why would she hide it in a locker relevant to the investigation? After you complete the investigation from the three points of view, you have the actually good idea of disguising as Martina to extract more information, which had me the rest of the game asking why they refused to do something similar again to assist in their main investigation. As Martina, you're brought to a particular peacekeeper who talks to you about Aiko's supposed suicide. He tells you something extremely important that nobody seems to know, which is that Karin backed up the fact that Aiko jumped off the roof, essentially confirming that she was responsible. This is a very helpful peacekeeper who, for whatever reason, happens to be holding two pictures of the crime from six months ago. He says he only has one, but you're shown two, the garden and the shoes, so I imagine that's just a text error. Something the game doesn't make completely clear is that they initially believed that Aiko's death was a suicide because they found her shoes on the roof. That's because in Japan it's customary to step up your shoes before suiciding. The moment this image of the shoes was shown, I knew that they would make the point that they were muddy so they must have previously been in the garden and taken after Aiko's death, when, for the love of god, the whole city is muddy. But by this point I was already used to the game working with very flimsy logic. The peacekeeper also happens to have a picture of Aiko, the same one found in the girls' lockers, cut out in a similar way. I have no idea why that is, but I have two questions. Question number one. Why is this photo from the flower bed ever made public? This peacekeeper shows it to you because he thinks you're his boss, but it's not actually the first time you've seen it. You're shown the same picture when Kurumi is first recounting the case, just for the player. At least to me, that gives off the impression that it's not a confidential image, since you're allowed to see it right away. But at the same time, it's an image that the peacekeepers surely would not have made public since the bricks are natural blood splatter makes it clear that the image is hiding a different truth, so I don't know why the game shows you an image you shouldn't be able to see yet. If you'll remember, at the end of the chapter, it's revealed that the peacekeepers spun the truth of Aiko's murder because Karin's father is a big shot at the Matarasu. So why is this guy casually carrying such a contradictory piece of evidence? And here comes my more important question number two. What in the world is this conversation between Martina and the peacekeeper? Why does he talk to his boss as if they seriously think that Aiko committed suicide when it was the peacekeepers themselves who spun the truth to hide that it was a homicide? Does the peacekeeper who's randomly holding three related pictures and investigated the case not know? I don't understand, but anyway, you're dragged to the chemistry lab next, where you find a paintbrush on the floor. It could only mean one thing. Yuma keeps acting as if the lab poison was for a fact the one used in the crime even though nothing actually confirmed it and you return to the hall where the real Martina chases you and ends up holding you at gunpoint. If there is one thing that will help with being held at gunpoint by a woman who has shown not to listen to reason, it's figuring out the truth, apparently. So you hop into the next mystery labyrinth with the Suhiko, who will be happy to waste as much of your time as possible. I'm fairly sure that if you remove every single line said by the Suhiko in the labyrinth and play that version of the game, you won't think anything is missing. The first 30 minutes are seriously a complete waste. You deal with Desuhiko's antics, do reasoning that matches that simply stress things you already know, the poison couldn't have been mixed in before the play, the poison vial was empty and couldn't have been used to pour the poison. 
Yuma says the cup scene occurred 45 minutes into the play, so I suppose he saw the 45 minutes in text because as far as I could tell no one said the time and there were no clocks anywhere, but fair enough. After a very dragged out first section where you conclude absolutely nothing, you're brought to the how done it part, in which everything will be spelled out exactly as you expected. How was the poison mixed into the glass? The game considers the absurdity that maybe someone used the water gun from the audience but says it's not possible because the glasses were upside down. If you're willing to consider that a possibility, why does it matter that the glasses were upside down? They could have watered the rim with poison which would have been effective too. It's just more of the needless time wasting the game loves so much. Then there is another deathmatch where you claim that Warunek couldn't have placed the poison on the glass when she walked up to the shelf because, for some reason, one of the staff members checked that all the costumes were poison-free before the play. But what does it matter? What if Waruna had a vial when she went to put on the dress? The check was done before she put it on, so it's useless. In the right path, you deduce that a paintbrush was used to coat the glass with poison because the culprit decided to throw the paintbrush on the floor after using it to commit murder, with the school being full of students, the hallways being crowded, and the chemistry lab having glass windows. Then you answer the completely random question of how was the poison glass brought to the stage? With a pouch, just because it feels right. Please explain to me where the pouch is. The third path is how was the right glass chosen? where in the first half you completely omit the very relevant information you know about Karin's script note. There is a reasoning death match where you say that Kurani couldn't have dropped the poison in the glass because of the 30 minute effect, exactly like in the first path, and then you reach a third dead end that the characters react to as if the other two paths didn't also lead to a dead end. These paths end with phrases like, Yoshiko brought the poison glass into the play but she can't be the culprit. Karana consciously pointed to the poison glass so Karin would pick it and die, but she can't be the culprit. These are actions that clearly contribute to the crime willingly, so what do you mean it's impossible that Karana was the one to commit the crime? You need to force the characters to be unreasonably dense, not to instantly mention that if Yoshiko brought the poison and Karana knew about the poison and pointed to it, they must have worked together. Before reaching that conclusion, though, you need to first solve Aiko's death. And you don't. You solve nothing. You just assume that Karin killed her, but there is zero actual evidence. Karin's crime is something that's made very obvious to the player, but all Yuma does here is speculate with the brick, the shoes and Karin's testimony. And he goes as far as to say things like, I think Aiko was told to meet at the flowers behind the school building. Where in the world do all these leaps come from? Anyway, Karin kills Aiko in the school garden, takes her shoes all the way up to the roof, reports the death to the peacekeepers, all for them to still figure out that it was her, and all for them to cover it up anyway because she's some important guy's daughter. With the truth behind Aiko's death magically confirmed by the labyrinth, you now see the present day crime from a new perspective, which is that the three girls work together to avenge Aiko in the least shocking revelation of the game, ahead of the culprit escaping through the clock tower window. Not gonna lie, the Shinigami puzzle basically spelling out accomplice before you even start made me laugh, same with Yuma crying out, that's right, accomplices, as if it's some alien concept that just came to his mind after ascending to a higher dimension, but I don't think that's the effect the game was going for. Something I'll give credit for is the flowchart formation when you see the three routes forming a single path. I think that's a neat idea and I wouldn't be surprised if it was what gave birth to the whole chapter, but I don't think making a case where the accomplice solution is the most basic one was the best way to go about it. When you consider accomplices, most of the picture neatly falls into place, but not quite everything. Yoshiko brought the poison from the lab during the play so that it wouldn't wear off in 30 minutes. Karan is shown the spotlight on the poison glass. But how did the poison glass make it to the stage? This is one of the last questions the game answers, and frankly the answer is so insane that they might as well have said that Yoshiko used the fishing rod to fish one of the glasses and then threw the poison one from her seat. I genuinely don't know if when they come up with some of these answers the whole staff agrees on claps in unison or if they shrug it off knowing that no sane person would swallow it but it does the job. Essentially, Yoshiko was sitting in the rightmost chair and had the poison glass. During the 5 second blackout, she placed it on the stage and Waruna, who was not standing where this representation shows but actually further left and hugging Karin, ran to the opposite edge of the stage without being heard and found the glass in 5 seconds with some night vision powers. Then, she hid the glass under her dress. What does that mean? What does it mean that she hid the glass under her dress? 
there is some big inner pocket that she put the glass in in the dark without being heard, and then she ran to the center of the stage before the lights turned back on. And that's only the first half of the trick, the second part is much worse. The game has the guts to say that when her back is facing the audience for 2 or 3 seconds, she swaps the glasses. How in the world would she swap the glasses? Where the script writers never shown Waruna's dress, it goes all the way to the floor. She would have to crouch to lift up the bottom of the dress, grab the poison glass, swap it, and then put the clean glass under her dress. All in 3 seconds and without being noticed by the audience. It's a trick that puts the water gun idea to shame and I have no idea how it manages to make it into the game. That's as far as the case goes. Everything is solved and admittedly the confession scene is pretty touching. There is some emotional attachment by the end, a stark contrast with chapter 1. While the events of the case still leave a lot to be desired, the setting, premise, characters, mood and conclusion are more appealing. It definitely puts together more of an identity than the previous chapters, but it fails to have anything actually remarkable. The main two questions, who killed Aiko and who killed Karin, are far too easy to see through, which is ultimately the case's biggest pitfall. I can definitely poke more questions at the overall plan. Why do it in a rehearsal with barely any people watching to act as witnesses? Is it truly a good plan considering the peacekeepers are known to fill in the gaps when something isn't fully consistent and arrest whoever they want? By acting as accomplices, they're putting some suspicion on themselves, so the peacekeepers could have easily arrested one of them and ignored the inconsistencies they created by working as a group. Also, the glass they replaced ends up being under Waruna's dress, so she would have been screwed if they found it before she could give it to Yoshiko. Call me crazy, but just picking Karin out after school and killing her when no one is looking just sounds like a better plan to me. Looking back, considering Kurumi was supposed to be one of Aiko's best friends, I think it's worth wondering why she didn't know that three of the four girls she was suspicious of were close friends with Aiko. Every single thing Yuma speculates ends up being the truth, and he says that the four of them were close friends given the picture they all had in their lockers, so I'm supposed to take it for granted. I know Kurumi wasn't part of the theater club in the past, but I don't know. If Yoshiko, Waruna and Kurane were always close friends with Aiko, it's hard to believe Kurumi knew nothing about it. So her introduction of the suspects ends up being a pretty mistaken representation. Well, once again, the labyrinth ends, the truth is grasped, and you're still being held at gunpoint. The three culprits die, which for some reason resolves the entire situation. Earlier, Martina ignored that Yuma's logic contradicted Kurumi's arrest, so I don't know why the girl's death and confession would make them release Kurumi and Sparrows, but it all works out. I expected the game to totally ditch Kurumi after chapter 2, but I'm glad she gets to stick around for the most important scene in the whole game. You take her to your private roof and the game slowly sets up for the line. The word homunculus is mentioned for the first time. I remember wincing in pain the moment I read it, and if you didn't, you probably haven't played enough games by Kodaka. If I have to sit through chapter 1 two more times to find out what he has in store this time, I will. Why does the rain never stop? It's not time to answer that. It's time to get bombed in the submarine. Please remember that a 500 IQ chess match is taking place in the shadows. A mysterious masked man is masterfully using you to accomplish his own goals, so he expertly planned that Yomi would place an ever so slightly non-lethal bomb in the submarine, and he hurries to bring your drifting body to his luxurious apartment where you see his mask for the first time. Who could be behind it? Your answer may depend on the amount of mystery visual novels you've played, but it's not difficult to consider why the game's hiding his face. There is also kind of an unfair scene before you wake up that makes you think you're really playing as a boy named Yuma, but I've not got much to say about it. Also, Martina becomes a Rubik's Cube. All things considered, waking up in this mysterious man's apartment, who you briefly see in the intro, is a promising hook for chapter 3, Infamously known in the Danganronpa series for always being one of the worst chapters. And this is truly a game made by the Danganronpa team. Have you ever asked ChatGPT to write a murder mystery for you? You just need to feed it a few elements and it will generate a fairly well-structured story. Chapter 2 tries to pull your heartstrings and create emotional impact so it makes sense they would want something more lighthearted next. An action-packed case about bombs, terrorists, flaws, and an unapologetic culprit who came up with the most brilliant plan you will ever find in any piece of media. For fun, I once tried to see if ChatGPT would come up with something compelling, 
and while it followed my premises well enough, it didn't even attempt to make any part of the plot coherent and it ended up sounding like the plot of any of my dreams. That's why I suspect that someone in the dev team of Raincoat came up with a hilarious idea of turning an AI-generated case into a fully fledged chapter. If that's not what happened, I seriously have no words. You're still in Makoto's apartment, who denies having heard the word homunculus and asks if number one is in town. I imagine that's a metaphorical question, that he's asking if number one is there in your mind, and he calls himself number one son, which is fair enough given the real context. What I don't think is fair enough is the mysterious lines they have him say when Yuma leaves the room. Hmm, so that's my... My what? They're trying to make you think he was gonna say dad, son, or brother. Makoto is essentially Yuma's clone, so thinking he was gonna say my clone or my original is forcing it a little. Then he says, I thought there would be more emotion involved. Why would there be more emotion involved meeting someone you're taking advantage of and want to kill after you're done manipulating? I feel like these two sentences are a bit of a cheap way to make you think they're family, which isn't quite right, but either way, as goofy as he is, Makoto's scenes manage to make him feel imposing, which is nice at this point in the game. After Yumi pays a quick visit to Makoto, you go find your crippled or dead friends, but if you want, you can choose to torture yourself with more side quests. In one of them, an NPC tells you to go around surveying people on their thoughts on the city, all of whom say, you're crazy, the peacekeepers are gonna hear you. But yeah, actually, I hate it here. And when you go report back, our comrade is getting arrested. More remarkably, there is another one that makes you expose the chapter 2 teacher, Stalker, who's been making her life miserable every day. You first consider it may be Desuhiko, your dead friend, but after gathering some intel and through flawless logic, you deduce it's the music teacher, who Desuhiko confessed to while disguised as the victim, and she was so flattered that she started stalking her every day. Now consider a little detail. Tezuhiko disguised as the victim in Chapter 2. After Chapter 2, you went to the submarine, got blown up, and woke up in Makoto's apartment. It's literally been less than 24 hours, but somehow this woman has been getting stalked for days. No big deal. You go to the blown up submarine to see if your friends are around, but you get kidnapped by two people in a van. Fear not, they're very nice people. And when this guy says, sorry for getting rough with you, it was necessary at the time, he means it. You got abducted to the Resistance hideout, who are fighting against the Matarasu from the slums and want to recruit you. All those flyers of protest you saw around the city were theirs, as they're putting together a powerful revolution. Yes, you heard that right. My side quest comrade gets arrested after muttering a few words of protest, but these people are running a revolution and sticking flyers everywhere facing no consequences. Now, seriously, was it necessary to abduct me to your hideout to ask me to join you? to stay hidden from the peacekeepers, but then you go around sticking flyers all over the place. Anyway, that's obviously just for drama, but it's real silly how Yuma completely shrugs off that they kidnapped him instead of talking to him before getting in the van or in the van itself. In the lobby, you get introduced to this chapter's cast of characters, made out of all the discarded Danganronpa designs. We've got a psycho girl obsessed with guns, a swimmer, an old guy, and Servan, not to be confused with Servant. You'll see them for 5 minutes in total. Shachi, your kidnapper, introduces you as a WDO master detective, which he knows thanks to the security cameras they've set up. The swimmer, his kidnapping partner, didn't even know that you were a master detective, meaning that they might usually go around kidnapping random people. After learning their goals, you're asked if you want to join the resistance, but it's a pointless choice because human declines anyway. To which Shachi says, I already knew you would turn us down. Okay, thank you for kidnapping me then. You agree to talk to him on the roof because he has one quick job he wants you to do, and before he follows you, you hear the gang talking about very important stuff, such as the fact that banking institutions are using the safe that makes you wait 5 minutes before it opens, probably irrelevant, and Iruka having made a custom gun for Shachi that looks heavier than Yuma but just in this shot. On the roof, Shachi teases his top secret info by saying homunculi do exist and they're already inside Kanai Ward right now. What does this guy know exactly? Is this supposed to mean that for some reason he knows the whole truth about the city? Well, before you get to know more, you have to take on his job. A job only a master detective could do, which they kidnapped you for. Placing four security cameras. If you know how the rest of the chapter follows, you will know he's being genuine. He really did kidnap a detective so that you'd place four cameras around the city. He says, if the peacekeepers see us setting up, they will definitely start investigating the organization. 
Please remember that these people have stuck flyers everywhere and have evidently set up many cameras already that they use to spy on you, but this is a job for a master detective. You accept the task and are given four cameras, which you go around setting up, but don't be mistaken, finding your friends is your top priority. In the shopping district, where you go to place the first camera, you can accept a new side quest. This NPC tells you to investigate the blood red rain, not blood pink. And you agree to go to Kamisaki District, where rumors about it have started. So you turn around to go to Kamisaki District, but Yuma says, there is no point to go to Kamisaki District. This is just one of the many ways the side quests feel entirely disconnected from the rest of the game, and it starts to get pretty jarring at some point. After placing the first camera, you take a minute to look for your friend, so you ask a few NPCs, and the most you get is that rainfall is gathered in a nearby facility. Then you're free to go to Ginma District to place the next camera, but instead go to Kamasaki District to run your latest errand, where you ask three people about the Red Rain, they know nothing about it, you conclude nobody knows anything about it, and when you go report back, you realize it's part of some cult that reveres the Red Rain that the original NPC was part of. Great, now you actually go to Ginma District and walk to the cafe, which Yuma says has tons of customers. Literally 70% of the seats are empty. Inside, you find Fubuki working as a waitress, but I mean, you already knew you would find her eventually since the tips and the save screens pull she's gonna be this chapter's companion. Another side quest unlocks, where a girl asks you to relay her feelings to the guy she likes. To refer to the disconnect I mentioned, Yuma thinks, that's the cafe in Ginma District. That's literally the cafe he was just at, and he's already in Ginma District. But anyway, not much to mention about this one other than the fact that Fubuki tags along the Roman's questline saying nothing. Next, you very surreptitiously place the third camera on top of a vending machine and the fourth one outside the academy. This is when you receive the exciting news that you've been placing bombs instead of cameras and that your watch will explode in 60 minutes. The first bomb in the shopping district explodes and you're framed as a terrorist in front of the whole city. You also receive a call from the criminal who talks to you using no voice distortion of any kind and tells you how to disarm the remaining three bombs. He gives you 60 minutes to disarm the next one, but since you believe in Shachi's good faith because of a couple sentences he told you, you decide to go to the slums to reason with the terrorists. On the way to the hideout, you learn that Fubuki can turn back time, and she saves you from being gunned down multiple times by guys with machine guns, proving that going to the terrorist base before learning that you could turn back time might have not been the best idea. To Fubuki's defense, the dumb girl with a really powerful trait can be endearing at times, and I would say she was a fitting companion for this chapter. She is so powerful that you decide to enter the hideout without her, yet again another brilliant idea by Yuma. She is exhausted from turning back time, so instead of resting with her before entering or deciding that the whole place is infested with peacekeepers so it's better to leave, Yuma chooses to enter alone. Why? Because someone is clearly about to die. And if Ibuki was with you, she could turn back town and expose the killer, which we can't have, so she's on hold for now. Inside the hideout, you're raided by peacekeepers and spot Shachi, who runs to the roof. Yuma's next outstanding move is to follow him to the roof from outside. I don't know what he expects he'll accomplish other than meeting the peacekeepers chasing Shachi face to face, but he recalls the emergency stairs and runs to the roof. Halfway there, he hears a gunshot, and 10 seconds later, he sees Shachi dead in the middle of the roof, completely alone, and an explosion can be heard soon after. Shachi is dead within that strangely colored pool, no one seems to be around, and the peacekeepers have been locked inside the hideout. Shachi is holding his own gun, and since the muzzle is hot, it must have been the weapon to take his life. So either he committed suicide, or someone killed him, put the gun in his hand, and vanished in 10 seconds. Instead of getting into what actually happened right away, I'll recap the events for a bit longer this time, so that I can talk having the full picture. After investigating the roof, ignoring the fact that armed peacekeepers could break the door down at any moment, the armed peacekeepers break the door down, but Yuma runs down the stairs and escapes. You meet back with Fubuki and there is some more QTE sections which might be the least dynamic sequences I've experienced in any game. There is a QTE and if you fail, you load back the scene, Rewatch the same sequence, but this time press the right button. Yuma says there are 15 minutes left until the second bomb and the watch explode. Somehow 45 minutes passed while they were messing around in the slums. To disarm the second bomb, you solve a puzzle you should be able to solve if you solve chapter 1, 
and then do more soul-sucking QTEs. You find Kurumi and explain everything that happened to her, and she thinks it would be a great idea to go back to the slums and find information on what's really happening behind the scenes, so she runs off. To disable the second bomb, you solve another puzzle taken from puzzles.com and are given 30 minutes to disable the last bomb. So what's a quick visit to an antique store gonna hurt? The old guy, one of the four leaders of the resistance, is casually working in his shop even though his teammates are getting chased by the police, they issue the declaration of war, and bombs have been set up throughout the whole city. He says he wouldn't personally take advantage of you, an innocent, unrelated person. Ignore that he was okay with killing you when you didn't want to join their group. Most importantly, he tells you that only one of the four hideout leaders could have taken Shachi's gun from their safe, so yet again the game narrows down the list of suspects to four, assuming it wasn't a suicide. Four potential culprits, but basically one of them is discarded as he's the one revealing the information you're using to narrow down the suspects, just like with Servant in Chapter 1. You ask him to give more details on the other three suspects, to which he says, Icardi is a swimmer. He's good at any sport that requires diving into water. Thank you for the very relevant information. Servan knows how to make bombs and has water trauma. Wow, it's almost like they're setting one of them up to be good with water and the other one afraid of it. He gives you his shop security footage in an envelope that he happened to have at hand, and Erika likes guns. You run through a QTE minefield to the third bomb's location and solve the last puzzle, which surely they made so that you'd have to turn back time at least once since you're not solving this one in 20 seconds. Your watch comes off and the world is saved, but things smell fishy. Imagine yourself in this situation. You're a wanted terrorist. Your face was shown to the whole city who was instructed to kill you on the spot. What do you do? You just sit around in a hotel lobby and wait for your friend who went to snoop around in the terrorist hideout. She comes back unharmed and gives you the security footage she stole from the hideout. It shows that you are the only person to go through the roof's emergency stairs. You also learn that there was a flood at the power plant you were just told about, so you go there. Don't ask me why, I don't know. You're a wanted terrorist without a plan, but a flood sounds intriguing. You clown around with the peacekeepers a bit more and eventually reach the flooded district. The whole police force was deployed to chase Yuma and raid the resistance, but there is not a single soul in the massive flooded district. No deaths, no panicking citizens, no police, but there is a boat. Why is there a boat? Who had a boat? Well, the good news is that you know how to pilot it and use it to reach the power plant. On the way, the only drifting object you see is a floating safe, to which Yuma says, something about this bothers me. Please realize the absurdity of the situation. You reach the power plant, which is also empty. By the way, ever heard about Icardi's boots? He's a swimmer and his boots are waterproof, thought you'd like to know. You learn there was an attack upstream which caused the power plant to overflow and flood the district, and you're suddenly cornered by the dynamic duo, who were tipped about your location. You're yet again in a position where figuring out the truth wouldn't help in any way. The perfect time to enter the mystery labyrinth, where every single riddle will be cracked and the whole puzzle will be laid out for you to admire. I'd say so far the chapter has been pretty engaging. It's had many silly moments, but you've come to expect that ever since the fifth car became the fifth car. Sadly, at no point were you prepared for what's about to happen in this labyrinth. Don't expect much for the first 30 or so minutes. As always, the start is padded with repeating information you already know and character banter that this time doesn't do the chapter any favors. They go overboard with making Fubuki overly delusional, calling Shinigami the god of darkness and contributing exactly zero. You spend some time defending your innocence, battling phantoms, saying that the security footage proves you didn't shoot Shachi. Is this actually needed? Why waste your time proving your innocence with the premise of the case? There is a whole sequence filled with almost no content that goes at a really slow pace, and then a deathmatch that makes the point that if someone sniped Shachi from the neighboring roof, the shot would have been at an angle. The game is too afraid to point out the obvious, that if Servan was the killer, the shot would have been at an angle too and that the killer has to be the same height as Shachi. So the pool of suspects gets narrowed down to two people very early into the labyrinth, the swimmer and Iruka. Here comes the first of many logic sacrileges. The game asks, what proves that it's a homicide and not suicide, and wants you to pick Shachi's custom-made gun. The gun proves it's not homicide because the chamber swings to the right, indicating that Chachi is left-handed and contradicting the fact that he had the gun in his right hand. It's simply impossible that a left-handed person used his right hand to commit suicide, ambidextrous people don't exist, 
and left-handed people can't use normal revolvers because they swing to the left. This is one of the biggest logic leaps in the whole game and that's saying a lot. I'll give it to the game that the gun swinging to the right does give room to suspect that Chachi was left-handed, but presenting it as airtight logic that proves it wasn't a suicide is not even attempting to make the game logically sound. And resorting to the old left versus right hand mystery cliche is bound to make anyone roll their eyes. Yuma says, if Shachi was right handed, he wouldn't have commissioned his gun to be designed this way. I'm fairly sure the word commission hasn't appeared in the game before this point. All they said is that Iroka made it for him, but you never get the feeling he would have commissioned it willingly given how anti-gun he acted. If you think that's bold, wait for the next statement. Shachi didn't commit suicide, all the evidence points to the contrary. Man, what evidence? Well, you use the word evidence correctly for once. You can speculate all you want, but there is zero evidence here. If that wasn't enough, you're literally battling a phantom that's not reading. This phantom is saying, so what if he was left-handed? He could have committed suicide with his dominant hand, which you counter by saying, Shachi was left-handed, but he was found dead with a gun in his right hand. We have literally gone over this already. This is exactly why the gun supposedly proved that Chachi's death was a homicide. Why am I battling a phantom that's not paying attention? This whole section felt like a fever dream full of mind-bending sentences like there is no reason he'd use his non-dominant hand to commit suicide. If you're just gonna solve this case by sticking to what sounds right to you, just point to your preferred culprit and let's get it over with. Amidst this gibberish, they also fail to bring up that Iruka, the one of the two potential culprits left, designed the gun and would have known that Chachi was left-handed so she wouldn't have placed it in the wrong hand. Of course, if it was mentioned here, the game would be left with one possible culprit halfway through the labyrinth, so you're gonna have to wait a bit more before making that obvious connection. Now, let's be real for a moment. Is it true that there is only one possible culprit left? No, of course not. Iroka could have just forgotten about Chachi's dominant hand in the rush of the moment, or Chachi's head was unnaturally tilted when Sir Man shot him, or the old man fabricated the security footage and told you about the safe to incriminate the others. The game even presents the crazy possibility that it could have been anyone in the world if Shachi just took his gun from the safe and then the culprit took it from him. And the argument used to deny it is that if someone tried to take Shachi's gun, he would have drawn it and the culprit would have noticed that he's left-handed. There is not even an attempt to say coherent things anymore. What if they stole his gun when his guard was down or when he was taking it from the safe? or they used a taser on him, or he gave it to someone he considered an ally, or he drew the gun with his non-dominant hand, or he drew the gun with his dominant hand and the killer didn't consider that he used his left hand because who would notice that? Or maybe the killer placed it in Chachi's right hand anyway because otherwise it would contradict the trajectory of the bullet and they were short on time. I doubt I actually have to explain why it's such a weak argument, and you just have to shrug it off and accept that it's the game's way of saying that it can only be a resistance leader. So, yes. If you play with the game's rules, there is only one possible culprit at this point, but fear not, because this has only gotten started. You're taken to a split path that asks, where did the culprit shoot from? Yet again, you're given two options that make no sense and one that does. You say the culprit was on the roof when they killed Shachi and recreate the scene before Shachi died. A big recurring question is, how did the culprit escape after shooting Shachi? Yuma repeats over and over that he took 10 seconds to reach the scene after hearing the gunshot. So what options are there, really? That he jumped to the huge neighboring pipes, used a rope, had a prepared trampoline on the ground, used a parachute, that he climbed down the utility pole behind? If the game said that the killer jumped down with a parachute, would it have been more ridiculous than some of the things it's already said? I really don't think so, which is why this mystery failed to interest me, because I could come up with many far-fetched solutions, all of which the game has proven to be bold enough to pull, and it's just a matter of waiting until the right one is revealed. Yuma says that there is no sign that a rope has been used, because he's used to getting served hints on a silver platter and expects to see fabric threads like in chapter 1 any time a rope is used for a trick. But it's very difficult to convince me that the culprit couldn't have escaped a few different ways with a simple rope. I'll use this opportunity to bring up a reason why some mysteries fail to have an impact on me throughout the whole game. Your companion can literally turn back time. The other guy could perfectly disguise as anyone and God only knows what the sleepy man can do. In every chapter, Yuma claims that certain things are impossible when they really aren't. And this worsens when you consider that people can't turn back time. Your friends have supernatural powers, but the game never makes the point that the culprits will not have them, or that one of your detective friends won't ever be the culprit. What if the killer became invisible after killing Shachi? 
I really tried, but it was hard to shake off the feeling that anything could happen, which isn't great for a game that loves to overuse the word impossible. Alright, the script is written as if you should completely rule out these possibilities, and you come to the truth after reconstructing the first time you stepped on the roof. The game brings attention to a drain that later got covered by the explosion rubble, which, fair enough, you could see the first time you were there, although it's unlikely most people paid attention to it. You can even see the drain when you're investigating Chachi's corpse, which goes to say how well thought out the culprit's plan was. Perfectly timed an explosion that doesn't take the building down but covers the drain. I can't believe such a genius plan actually failed to perfectly cover it. I imagine anyone instantly understood what the game was getting at when it revealed the drain. The culprit jumped to it from the roof. But the game thinks you have the deduction abilities of a panda bear and gives you a solution key that you have to instantly use in a deathmatch. And then there is a second deathmatch to say that the culprit jumped into the drain. Why is it so sluggish? The culprit shot Shachi on the roof, placed the gun in his right hand, jumped into the drain and detonated an explosion to partially cover his escape route so that the peacekeepers wouldn't find out how he vanished. Assuming this makes sense for a moment, can I just ask, what if the peacekeepers just happened to know there was a drain there? What if any of the ground level peacekeepers saw the culprit jumping? Why does the game brush off that Yuma doesn't hear the culprit diving into water? Those are questions for another time because the game gets into the bigger question of it all. Who is the culprit? Who is the only person who could have committed such an elaborate plan? Someone who could have jumped into water. Water. That's it. There is one person whose only trait so far has been said to be good at swimming. Like 10 times. And wait a moment, he's the only possible suspect left. It's gotta be him. This guy. He's the mastermind behind the whole ordeal, according to Yuma, who says, the culprit issued a proclamation of war on behalf of the resistance and against the peacekeepers. Okay then, even though not a single thing proves that's the same person who killed Chachi. Turns out that this guy planned to kill Chachi by luring the peacekeepers to their hideout and predicting at least five different things in advance. That even though all the other resistance leaders left, Chachi would stay. That the peacekeepers would raid the building but Chachi would survive and escape. That he wouldn't run off the front door even though it was a much safer route. That he would run up to the roof which just corners him. And that, upon reaching the roof, the peacekeepers would be approximately 10 seconds behind him. All of it perfectly calculated by his crystal ball. The game attempts to remedy part of this without noticing that it's ripping apart its own plot. Yuma says, the roof must have been a planned escape route the resistance had, and that's how the killer knew that Chachi would take it. As a matter of fact, the peacekeepers were locked up there. If he hadn't been killed, he would have escaped. Okay, first of all, he probably wouldn't have escaped since he still has to run all the way down and can be easily ambushed, but let's assume that he would have escaped. Don't you see that this completely breaks the killer's plan? If the resistance leaders had planned to run up and lock the roof in an emergency situation, after killing Shachi, the peacekeepers would have been unable to storm into the roof in time, and the swift trick, jumping into the drain, would have been useless. It only worked because Yuma happened to be there immediately after Shachi's death, which wasn't part of the plan. The killer intended to trick the peacekeepers, who he should have known would end up trapped inside for minutes, more than enough time to leave the roof with a rope or through multiple different methods. If the killer wanted the plan to work, to make the peacekeepers think that nobody could have left so fast, he could have taken the key, which I get is risky, but by leaving it in the door your whole plan loses all meaning. It's time for Yuma to accuse the culprit. It can't be the old guy because of the camera footage that you didn't even look at. Can't be Iroka because Shinio Shachi is left-handed and humans never make mistakes. Can't be Servan because he's afraid of water. Only the swimmer is left, who happens to be a swimmer. We got him. He becomes a ninja turtle and this is where things are taken up a notch. There are many things left to answer. The bombs, the flood, the motive. To tackle these questions, the first thing Yuma claims is that the whole bombing nonsense was a diversion. They made you set up four bombs, program some IQ puzzles, issued a war declaration, and leaked your face to the peacekeepers so that you would go around destructing officers. Keep in mind that this guy didn't know you were a master detective at the start, and if you didn't have time traveling powers, you would have been arrested or killed on the spot, but he really expected that you would go to the four bomb locations chased by incompetent peacekeepers who would leave him alone. At the same time, he lured more peacekeepers to the resistance hideout, perfectly predicted how everything would play out, and waited on top of the roof to kill Shachi and escape into the drain. All of it, for what? 
He first says that it was all part of a contrived plot where Shachi committed suicide, but you don't swallow it because you totally downloaded Shachi's character after he spoke three lines to you, and you think the man who kidnapped you could never do wrong. Then, out of nowhere, and in the most bizarre turn of events I've ever witnessed, the game smacks your head with the line, you just wanted to take the saves. Based on the one floating safe he saw, Yuma comes to the insane conclusion that this was all a bank robbery. It was like when you're somewhere in a dream and suddenly teleport to the beach. Suffice to say, Yuma is completely spot on. If I've complained about logic leaps before, where do I even start here? The bombing, the war, Shachi's death, all of it gets solved by a floating safe that Yuma sees and the swimmer admits to it. He disagreed with Shachi's idealistic vision, so he planned to make it big and leave the city. His plan was to put the peacekeepers focus on Yuma and the resistance, knowing it would be the perfect time to flood the whole district. He foresaw that there wouldn't be a single soul around, no deaths, citizens or peacekeepers, and that the safes that the banks use would flow to the surface. What are you talking about? Are banks keeping their safes next to the door? Are safes gonna walk out of the inner room that they're in to reach the surface? The whole surface would be so infested with floating furniture that it would be impossible to navigate, but he was planning to fish them out individually from a boat. This is the most ridiculous plot I've ever heard and there is no defending it. It's not even goofy good like chapter 0, this goes way over the line. How was he planning to leave the city? How was he planning to open the safes before leaving the city? How is he gonna carry them with this boat? Why was nobody in the flooded district? Every peacekeeper was occupied tailing Yuma, right? Like when he happily disarms the last bomb without a single soul around. How did he know that they wouldn't kill Yuma right away? How did he know how everything would play out in the hideout? There are infinite more questions I could ask, but I'll stick to two that are very important. 1. Why did he kill Shachi? This isn't even asked a single time. There is no reason to kill him. Somehow, he successfully deployed every single peacekeeper to raid the slums and tail Yuma, so why kill Shachi? He could have jumped into the drain and reached the flooded district, which was already completely vacant, so Shachi's death is pointless. Great, he makes it look like suicide. What does he think that's gonna accomplish? That all the peacekeepers are gonna stay in the hideout to mourn his death. And two, let's assume he had a reason to kill Shachi. He just wanted him dead before leaving. What's the point behind the contrived setup to blow up some rubble and hide the escape drain? His plan involves leaving the city after committing a robbery, so why does it matter? He goes around fishing safes from a boat and is preparing to escape. If the peacekeepers find him, he is already screwed, so the means to not incriminate himself in Shachi's death are pretty pointless considering he's gonna get arrested if he's spotted anyway. Putting the gun in Shachi's hand, blowing up the building, there is no need for it. By making it look like a suicide, you just make it less likely that the peacekeepers will stick around to investigate what happened. Well, somehow, the whole truth is out and I give up trying to make sense of it or bringing to light the good parts. There is no salvageable part in the culprit's plan and everything gets solved without a single piece of evidence. Run through the labyrinth and you will see that not a single piece of evidence is presented to establish a point. The gun means that Chachi is left-handed. Only a swimmer could have jumped from the roof. Surely the bombs were a diversion. I saw a floating safe so this must be a bank robbery. The overall picture of the case is held together with hopes and dreams and it's all beyond absurd. At least you're out of the labyrinth, which solves nothing in the real world for the fourth time. Not until your friends come to save the day. They caught the swimmer and his buddy, who for some reason he didn't kill. It's worth mentioning that the geniuses must have seen us in the power plan and leaked our location to the peacekeepers, contradicting their plan one last time. The whole thing was orchestrated to take the focus away from the flooded district, but they called the peacekeepers here so that they can be spotted fishing a couple saves. Just outstanding. Unfortunately for them, they were caught because it turns out that not everyone actually evacuated. Crazy to think about. Once again, the peacekeepers don't kill us, this time because we have proof that these people are the real criminals who died of a heart attack. The game doesn't even bother to play with its own rules, so they just let us go. Next, Makoto comes from the skies with a balloon, yet another way the culprit could have escaped from the roof. I do hope he was enjoying seeing me from his apartment getting gunned down through the whole city. I guess he didn't feel like stepping down at that time. He saves us from Yomi, it's revealed that he is the CEO of Matarasu, and he says that there are internal conflicts within the company that make things difficult, but that if he had evidence of Yomi's wrongdoings, he would kick him out. Having completed the game, I can't say I fully understand this. What evidence does he need? 
Who is he gonna report it to? The soldier peacekeepers? Are they supposed to think that Yomi is a saint? Or other people within the company? Anyway, he has a surprise for you. An identical submarine down to every single piece of paper inside. To be totally unfiltered, I think this chapter is terrible. It reaches a level of absurdity that I wasn't prepared for. Every step of the way is filled with holes and assumptions. The killer is set up as the killer from the point they randomly say he's a swimmer, and the whole cast is made out of stick figures with a single trait. Is it worse than chapter 1? Well, while chapter 1's investigation was definitely more soul-crushing, chapter 3 sets up some real potential and then flushes it away. I like that it sets up high stakes at the start, and Fubuki is a fitting companion that balances out the mood. While nothing to write home about, if the labyrinth stuck the landing it could have been a decent filler chapter, but saying it doesn't stick the landing is an understatement. All things considered, not many things have evoked the raw sense of disbelief this case had on me, so at least it's not a cakewalk of a chapter that left me indifferent. Before the chapter ends, the game makes clear that VBA is next and the screen fades to black. Um, does anyone remember that my face was shown to the whole city as a wanted terrorist to kill on sight? No? Everyone forgot already? Okay. Four chapters into the game, it's time to touch on the section that spiritually replaces Danganronpa Trials and where all the cases get solved, the Mystery Labyrinth. Trials were most people's favorite part of the Danganronpa games because the formula was pretty much perfect. You battle it out against the potential culprits, spot contradictions, come to logical conclusions, and end up exposing the killer. At first glance, it seems very similar to the Mystery Labyrinth. People may even say it's a straight copy, as the game goes out of its way to repurpose every aspect of the Trials without even stopping to consider what made them good in the first place. But while Trials were pretty much a perfect way to unveil every element of the case, the Mystery Labyrinth makes a lot of missteps trying to replicate the same type of high paced conclusion. Some of them come from the way the labyrinths are executed, while others come from the concept itself. I imagine most people are excited when they're brought to the first Mystery Labyrinth and given the basic rundown. You will solve every question related to the mystery and expose the truth. It sounds great, dynamic and engaging, so it's a shame that, in the execution, Many labyrinth are structured in such a slow and repetitive way, where every point is repeated multiple times, death matches halt the pace of things, and points that shouldn't be emphasized so much are shoved down your throat. This is nothing new, I've talked about it while summarizing the chapters, and it could be solved by structuring the labyrinths differently, so it's not what I'll focus on. To begin with, since when is a labyrinth supposed to be a straight road? When I read about the concept, I envisioned branching paths and a whole lot more player interaction. It's hard to come to terms with the word labyrinth when all you do is make your way down a corridor. You never feel stuck, you never feel like you're in a labyrinth, so the expectations generated by hearing the term for the first time are not lived up to. There are a lot of issues I want to bring up, but two of them are crucial. One, the labyrinth itself spoon feeds you the answers. And two, you're not cornering the real culprit. Anyone who's played Danganronpa will understand what the second point is getting at. The phantoms are not enough to make you feel like you're battling and exposing the real culprit. They are brainless mobs that are lying 100% of the time and have no emotional connection to the case. When you corner the real culprit and get them to confess, you're not watching an organic breakdown and confession, it's just a mirror image of the culprit. In reality, the killers die without ever knowing that they have been caught. This is night and day compared to slowly cornering the killer, seeing them break down when they notice that they're about to be exposed, and confessing when there is no longer any way out. A phantom popping out of nowhere, clearly framed as an antagonist, and challenging your deduction usually with very flimsy logic, falls short of an organic discussion where you've got to spot the outlier who won't poof out of existence after being picked out. This made the labyrinths feel strictly like puzzles, lacking the social deduction aspect. Since the real characters involved are not present, it takes a lot to feel empathy, disdain, or to view the phantoms as anything more than obstacles. If the game had put all the eggs in one basket and remedied this problem with tight and intricate cases, it wouldn't feel like as big of a loss, but with how basic and silly a lot of the mysteries are, there really needed to be something else to make up for it. I would say the first point is even more critical. The labyrinth does the detective work for you. I don't have enough fingers to count the number of times the labyrinth gives Yuma the answer wrapped in paper and with a ribbon on top, usually accompanied by two wrong answers that make zero logical sense. 
He doesn't actually infer these answers through clues, they just drop from the sky for free, which completely bypasses any deduction process. In the cases where Yuma actually did come to a conclusion on his own, no matter if any evidence backs it up, the labyrinth confirms or denies it at no cost. This is another way the game skips having to provide actual evidence, since over and over, you're just throwing things in the air to see if something sticks. Throughout the whole labyrinth, you're taken by the hand and given the right question you should be asking, you're given the answer for free, and you're brought to the conclusion to take from that answer. All because the labyrinth itself confirms things as the truth before they have been proven. In Chapter 0, what proves that the culprit played dead in the infirmary? The knife stabbed into the cushion? No, it doesn't prove it. Maybe it vaguely indicates it, but there is no evidence other than the fact that the labyrinth reveals it's correct. In Chapter 1, you realize that there is a copycat killer only because the labyrinth doesn't end after accusing the priest. There is no deduction of any kind. Now, there are times when you do provide evidence to establish a point, but even this is very inconsistent. You use evidence that's never been confirmed, like the peacekeeper saying that all the corpses burned to death in Chapter 0, or that the coffee had a knockout drug. This could easily be fake pieces of evidence created by the culprit, but they get hard confirmed because the labyrinth cheats for you. In Chapter 2, you say that Korane couldn't have mixed the poison because her lighting partner said she did nothing strange, but in what world is that evidence? She could have been an accomplice, or threatened, or mistaken. It could never be interpreted as something that shuts down the possibility, but the king treats it as if it is. There is another problem that comes from this. You're basically presenting your memories as evidence, but you can't present the fact that you know you're innocent. If you say, the lighting partner told me Korane didn't do anything strange to refute a statement, why can't you say, no, I'm innocent, to refute the times you're accused of being the killer, like when you have to use the security footage in Chapter 3 to prove that you didn't kill Shachi? What even is the point of evidence? In Chapter 1, you make up the fact that the footprints near the clock tower match those of the priest to corner him when you have no evidence, and it works to make him confess. So what's the point? Just bluff every time and say DNA analysis confirmed you're the killer to every phantom until one of them confesses. The rules of what can be used as evidence change the whole game, but some of them can be seen from a mile away. Many times, during the investigation, you get a piece of evidence and instantly envision how it will be used in the labyrinth, often to re-establish a point you already know or to bring about a predictable line of thought. A third point that hurts the labyrinth nearly as much is the execution of reasoning death matches. There are so many of these, that late into the game I dreaded seeing any of them pop up, mainly because of three reasons. One, you're just battling a phantom that you have no connection with. Two, they're almost never used to establish interesting points. And three, the statement you have to refute can be very ambiguous. I won't repeat the first point, but like I said before, refuting what a phantom says, not the real character, doesn't add any excitement. Points 2 and 3 are a much bigger deal. Death matches are almost never used for a breakthrough or to get to new conclusions. They just beat around the bush and offer nothing new for the case. They're usually used to challenge your latest conclusion with very weak logic, to make sure you understand what the game just said, or to get the most basic possibilities out of the way. So you come to understand that when a death match comes up, it's just a little stopping point that won't lead to anything of substance, and to rub salt in the wound, the game adds a twist where sometimes you just need to refute blue text before the actual deathmatch starts, as if they needed to be more time wasting. As for point 3, this really managed to frustrate me. Most of the time, you know right away where the weak spot is in the phantom's logic, but that's not enough. You gotta counter the right statement with the right bullet, and there are times where this is way too specific. In Chapter 2's first deathmatch, you're trying to say that Korani couldn't have poisoned the wine glass. You have the wine bottle and the lab poison as solution keys. You need to use the lab poison solution key to say that the effect couldn't have lasted the 45 minutes of the play, even though nothing has confirmed that's the poison that was used, and even though the wine bottle solution key says that no poison was detected in or on it, you can't use it to refute the statement she mixed in the poison with the wine. It contradicts it perfectly, but only the game's one intended rebuttal is valid, and on top of this, it's to come to a conclusion you very much already know about, as is customary with death matches. In the same chapter, there is another one where you gotta refute that Korane dripped the poison right in, but you can't refute that she used an eyedropper to add the poison. 
Why make it so finicky? They are basically saying the same thing. These are just two examples, but the whole game is full of statements in death matches that are invalid despite implying the same thing as the valid statement or contradicting another solution key. Every single aspect of Danganronpa Trials is reskinned and present one way or another. Some work fine, like the comic book, and others feel as jarring as always, like Shinigami Puzzle, which serves as the good old hangman's gambit and meets the game's full fan service quota on its own. It could be fine if it didn't just come out of nowhere in situations where a minigame that makes you spell a word isn't the best choice. What does it want here? Thread, string, line, rope. Why use it for cases where the player may think of different words? The most baffling case is in Chapter 3, where the game uses a Shinigami puzzle for a binary choice, Shachi's dominant hand, which the amount of available letters reveals in case you weren't sure. I don't know if these are localization issues, but it's something that carries on from Danganronpa. Also, for some bizarre reason, even though getting a question wrong is meaningless and hardly lowers your health bar, if you run out of time in Shinigami puzzle, you game over, and depending on which one you fail, you may have to redo a big chunk of the labyrinth. There is a skill tree system where you exchange points for abilities that assist in the minigames. It's a bit particular in that you can equip every single skill you unlock without having to manage them, and they're all useful except from the one that makes the Shinigami puzzle barrel spin slower. It makes it go so slow that you'll run out of time waiting for the letters to come back. The crime scene recreations are done by recalling Yuma's memories of the scenes, so how can he discover things he never saw, like the backside of a pillow that he never looked at in the real world? Spot selections are fine, but this one in chapter 2 tripped me up because selecting the light is wrong. You have to select the light source. God Shinigami is cool once, but never again, and thank god that a recent patch enabled the skip function in the case summary. If you pick the wrong option, you will walk the whole path for a minute, read some empty dialogue, fall into the abyss, and teleport back so that the characters can repeat everything they already said before. There is no need to punish you with two minutes for getting something wrong. In between sections, there is so much fluff text that's not related to the case and you can't advance or fast forward it. Sometimes, the game lets you fast forward at 110% speed, but others, like at the end of the blue section in chapter 2, you have to sit and wait before moving on. The game doesn't even let you read at your own pace. Also, you better not be deaf or have the game at a low volume, because in these sections there is no way to know who's talking, and if during a loading zone, you happen to go get a snack, do the dishes, go grocery shopping, take a shower, and come back, the loading might have ended, and if it did, the characters will have started talking on their own, so you probably missed the whole conversation. It happened to me more than once because I had the tendency to check something during loading times. I have to mention something that I'm sure I was not the only person to be bothered by. For a game that gives the spotlight to one character per chapter and then ditches them, it really had no business erasing their memories of the labyrinth. Every companion you take into the labyrinth forgets all about it after getting out, which is only meant to create a dilemma at the end of the game. This eliminates any character growth, and makes it so that at the end of the game, only Vivian knows a little about Yuma, the only one to remember what happened in the labyrinth. Since they also don't remember the details of the case when they're in the labyrinth, they almost never offer anything of value other than banter and sticking to their gimmick. Added to the phantoms, this is another way the game gives up on meaningful character appeal in the labyrinths. I've just got a couple more things to mention. One is in regard to the game-long theme of whether fighting the truth is worth it. The game really tries to present this as a moral dilemma, but it only comes across as a dilemma because solving the labyrinths kills the culprits, which is independent of the concept of reaching the truth. Yuma's fixation with whether reaching the truth brings any positives is not the real dilemma. If anything, he should be wondering whether to keep using Shinigami's power, but the game really misrepresents the dilemma and fails to bring up that he only has it in relation to the mystery labyrinth. To end, I have to emphasize the issue that I brushed off at the start of this section, because beyond every complaint that I have, this is the real killer. The labyrinths aim to be snappy, shocking, and filled with constant spectacle, but they're actually filled with slow walking, going over known information, and jaw-dropping loading times. Even if some of the inherent problems the format has were addressed, the execution is what hurts it the most in Rain Code. There are times it does nice effects and shows that there are neat ideas behind certain parts, but the constant glacial pace and predictability break it wide open. In Chapter 0, you gotta choose that the culprit committed suicide, which is taken as the right answer when it's not. You gotta first take the wrong path, go back, and use your new knowledge on the path that was previously marked as wrong. 
Everything is so scripted. What if you suspected that the stabbing was a red herring from the start? Well, you have to take exactly the path the game wants, which is why it doesn't feel like a labyrinth at any point. Nothing is freeform. In Chapter 4, after you expose the culprit, the game opens up a hidden dungeon to uncover a side mystery. Ideally, something like that could be optional if you search for it. As it stands, the beginning and end are usually very drawn out, and the middle, which focuses on the details of the case, suffers from extremely simple mysteries, a lot of which have logical inconsistencies and are solved with magic devoid of actual reasoning. The result ends up being simple mysteries told in the most roundabout way possible, which, at least in my eyes, really doesn't fit the format. The frenetic, high-paced intensity clashes head-on with being asked how the culprit escaped from the clock tower or how the killing in Chapter 2 could have been orchestrated. But to end on a hopeful note, I do think there will be a sequel to this game, and hopefully a lot of these matters will be looked into, because even though it needs a lot of refining, the ideas they're working with could lead to something really fun. Hopefully, next time, they realize that you don't need to be told the same thing five times, that there is nothing wrong with letting users play at their pace, I hope they identify that a few decisions they made actively worked to remove impact from the labyrinths, and that resorting to riddles for preschoolers might have not been the best idea. Now let's get back to business, because chapter 4 has some big shoes to fill. There is only one character left before what's likely gonna be the final chapter. So I had a feeling this game would follow in Danganronpa's footsteps and try to lead into the final chapter with a bang. I wouldn't be shocked if this ends up being most people's favorite chapter, strictly because it remembers a few things the staff should have long ago learned with the Danganronpa series. That is, if the player has some attachment to the characters involved, they will be more engaged and things will hit harder. This shouldn't be a foreign concept for this team, which is why chapters 1 to 3 being completely detached from the main cast and overarching story is so mind-boggling. A case that directly relates to one of the main characters comes very late, but that's not all, it comes very late even in this chapter. I'll wait before letting on how we feel about chapter 4 and whether it's the saving grace I hoped it would be. Divya reveals he heard about the existence of a secret lab, so you go investigate. But as you've already learned, these people don't know how to investigate. Alara says that the only way to find the lab is to search everything and scour everything. Yet somehow it's chapter 4, you're investigating the Amaterasu company, and you haven't even considered going to the huge Amaterasu building. Who's supposed to be shocked that the endgame takes place in the obvious endgame place? Even now, your method of investigating is just going around talking to NPCs. You find out that the real Yuma set up a restaurant in under a week, and you can do more side quests, which are the epitome of meaningless time-wasting content. You find a gone psycho who is depressed. You go to the shop so her partner can help her out. But first you've got to deliver a package. You traverse the slums back and forth to give Servan food, who run away from the peacekeepers like you've been doing the whole game. You go back to the shop. The old guy gives you a gun, which you give to the gun lover to solve all her problems because gun girl won gun. And the game even has the guts to say there is meaning in that, because the gun isn't real. This is the most miserable side content I've experienced in any game. Another one involves one of Fubuki's simps forcing you to buy a gift for her, so you just go to the shop marked on the map and come back. The nun makes you go around talking to NPCs and solving their issues with a magical spell like telling them, I think things are okay as they are. And there is a mind-numbing fortune-telling fraud scheme you've got to expose in the destroyed district that takes like 15 minutes to go through. Please don't ask me why I'm still doing the side quest in Chapter 4. There is nothing remotely redeeming in them, and when you've done one, you basically have an idea of what they're all like. I'm sure I only did them because you can turn your brain off and follow the map's mark point, but I can only assume that most people are going to learn to ignore them. Since you're useless at investigating, you go ask the CEO of the company you're investigating where they set up the secret lab, and he accepts showing it to you. This whole section is so unbelievably odd. Makoto says, I was planning to take you there at some point anyway. You don't insist on asking what he meant by that. He says there is nothing shady going on at the lab, but that you may never see your friends again if you go. They don't talk about why exactly they're going. Yuma doesn't think about why he's going other than to investigate. And he doesn't really think about how strange it all is. Point is, you go talk to your friends one last time, but all you do is pay Yako a quick visit. You tell him nothing about your alleged danger, and you go to the lab. As you descend underground, Makoto briefly tells you about their genius research commander, Dr. Weska, who is suspected of having done some shady businesses behind the scenes with someone from the company. 
In the lab, you're told that the peacekeepers were sent a death threat targeting Dr. Weska and signed by some legendary hitman. The doctor is a grumpy old man who has barricaded himself behind top-class security designed to kill anyone who tries to bypass it. The security system, which the game frames as completely impenetrable, works like this. Leading to Dr. Weska, there are three chambers. An air decontamination room, a room that releases deadly gas, and a room where you gotta solve a witness puzzle first try or you get electrocuted. Stepping on the correct panels lets you reach the other side and open the door, but if you step on the wrong ones, you get zapped. So, this impenetrable security is the gas room and the panel room. In the gas room, you can just walk forward unscathed because the gas takes 30 minutes to kill you. Once again, the game does a horrible job at getting an important point across, which is that in these 30 minutes, you're lively as a ferret. The initial explanation, it takes some time for the toxins to spread throughout your whole body, makes it sound as if you wither in pain for 30 minutes until you pass away, not that you're completely fine until it's time to go, which is an abysmal decision if you're looking for security. If you don't want to die, you can just put on a suit so that the gas doesn't penetrate to you, so that's two ways to reach the panel room, either tank the gas or put on a suit. Now, how do you beat the impenetrable panel room? It's not very clear if just reaching the other side and pressing the button next to the door is enough to open it, or if you do have to first press the panels in the correct order. If you just had to reach the other side, I don't know, build a bridge that doesn't touch the panels, or unfold a long stick to press it from the other side. Sounds easy enough, and keep in mind that there are no cameras. If you do have to press the switches in the right order, just bring a few rocks and throw them at the switches until you figure out the right combination. Okay, but what if the system is rock-proof? What if it needs to identify a human being before validating a panel? Considering that only adjacent panels are valid, and that the room tells you when you found the right answer by turning all the panels blue, you have three possible panels to start with. I don't know if the starting point is guaranteed to be the middle one, so let's act like it's not and say that this is a 33% chance of guessing the right panel, which is the middle one. Then you have a 33% chance of guessing the next panel, the left one. Here, only up is valid, and here you have a 50% chance to guess right, which is the next correct panel. This is the final choice. It's another 50% chance that if you do correctly and move right, now you only have one possible move until all the panels turn blue, no matter which of the remaining solutions is correct. This boils down to a 2.7% chance of first trying the puzzle. And if the first move is guaranteed to be the middle panel, that's an 8.2% chance. He designs this contrived input method in which both options fare way worse than a simple password prompt. Why? Well, according to the game, it's to instill fear within anyone who may attempt it. But a simple password prompt that kills you when you fail it would accomplish the same, and there are no instructions on how the system works anywhere. Later, the doctor even tries to kill you by luring you in, hoping you don't know how the system works. I get that this is all set up to make an interesting set of events happen, but I don't think hoping for something that makes reasonable sense is that much to ask. And please remember that you could bypass the whole thing by throwing rocks. Now, it's okay if you want to shrug off the fact that this is a ridiculous and extremely inefficient system, but it's inconsistent within the system itself. Does anyone notice the absurdity of the gas chamber being designed to kill anyone who enters it, while chamber 3 is designed so that select individuals can complete it by inputting the panel combination? How is anyone supposed to reach chamber 3 to input it if chamber 2 is designed to eliminate everyone? And to go further than that, why does the panel combination exist? The game says only Dr. Weska knows the right combination, so when he's in the lab, why does inputting the combination open the door? It means it necessarily has to be an intruder who guessed it right, so there is no reason the door should open. And if Weska is not in the lab, it means it's him trying to enter his own lab, in which case the gas chamber would kill him. Alright, that's enough ranting, and you have no time to ponder this before Yomi locks you in a room anyway. A while later, Tezuhiko and Yaku come to save you disguised as peacekeepers because they received the same death threat and found the secret lab right away. I gotta let the cat out of the bag early this time. Yaku was the one who sent the death threats and is here to kill Dr. Weska and then die because Weska killed his wife four years ago. In order to reach Weska's location, Yaku needs Fubuki's time travel powers to figure out the panel password, but he will not instruct her to solve it. He will just encourage her to do so by making Weska appear in danger. And he accomplishes that by working with a real hitman who turns off the breakers at the perfect time and then acting like he's gonna distract the peacekeepers. For some reason the game doesn't mention, the Suhiko and Yako take off their disguises, which is a terrible idea. Then, what comes after is a big load of BS that there is no way for me to come to terms with. First, you run against Fubuki disguised as a peacekeeper by complete chance, 
which Yako must have predicted, and then you call the doctor and talk to him over the intercom to check on him. Also, Fubuki takes off her disguise too, which works out to let Weska, who is deaf, read her lips, but there is no good reason she would do that. Since the blackout didn't affect the security system, you would expect the doctor to say that he is okay and there is no need to worry about him. There would be no need to reach his room, but that's not what happens. As if to alley up Yako's plan at the perfect time, and totally unpredictably, he acts as if he sees an intruder in his room and cuts off communication. This is just an act, an unpredictable and nonsensical act, but it's what makes Yuma and the rest try to reach the doctor and it's what lets Yako's plan continue. It's not because of the blackout, which was the original plan. It's because of this unpredictable behavior. But that's far from the worst that comes from this. Dr. Weska lying about there being an intruder is no different from lying to the player. I view it as a completely unfair and unforgivably coincidental trick. By making him act like there was an intruder when the security system was active, most of the chapter ends up revolving around how the culprit entered when the security system was active. And it's the one fact that makes this appear like a very difficult case to crack. It doesn't seem possible that the killer bypassed the security system, but it's all a lie. The case is based on a blatant lie. A lie that happens at an impossibly perfect time. It's what ends up making Yako's plan work because it's what makes us barge into the lab. And it's what makes trying to solve the case feel futile. If the doctor didn't do this, it would be crystal clear that he's killed when you unlock the security system. But again, you would not even try to unlock the security system in that case because the doctor would have appeared safe. Did Weska have a good reason to lie about there being an intruder at least? No, not at all. He's completely insane. He sees three kids on the intercom, and since he wanted to flee from the city because of an internal conflict, he saw this as the perfect chance to escape. By faking danger, he hoped that one of them would rush in to save him and be killed by the security system. So, he bet on them not knowing about the security system that's designed only so that everyone is afraid of it. And mind you, he saw you with the CEO of the company earlier. So how would you not know about it? The game says he wanted to lure a visitor so that no one would miss the dead person. Would be a shame if you had been smart and kept the peacekeeper costumes. Also, are the two friends who would stay alive supposed to forget about their dead friend and never report them missing? Then, assuming he managed to kill you and nab your corpse, he planned to dissolve it in acid to make the peacekeeper somehow find it by disabling the security system, make them think he had been dumb enough to shower himself with acid, and then what? Put on a disguise and leave the underground lab? He can't just do that? I feel like a complete idiot trying to make sense of this plot, but it's the best they came up with to establish the lie that nearly breaks the whole case apart. I don't want to sound unfair and as if I'm only bringing up the bad stuff. It's great that the stakes are higher, you feel more tension, and it's more intriguing than the other chapters from the get-go. But the stuff if mentioned seriously brings it down. At this point in the game, you're still totally clueless as to what's really going on, so you go acquire a toy robot you saw earlier, which Yako perfectly predicted. Pointing to the fact that Yako is predicting this may sound like a weak complaint, but consider that Yuma is the one who brings it up. Yuma wasn't even part of Yako's plan. He just happened to be at the lab at the same time by coincidence. He never told Yako he was going there, but he is the one who moves his plan along. You're given a robot and explained in minute detail how it works, and after being told over and over that they are developing state-of-the-art technology, this almost feels like a joke. The robot can move and play for sounds, but it cannot move while extending its arm. Don't you forget that. Anyway, the creator of the robot cannot come with you because if someone happened to stay outside the security chambers, the whole plan would be ruined for Yako. Similarly, if you decided to pilot the robot from the air chamber instead of locking yourself outside of it, same thing would happen because Yako couldn't jump on the robot. And please someone explain to me why he jumps on it. Why doesn't he just gently step on it? He tanks the deadly gas, and in the panel room, the geniuses outside realize that their plan never considered that they still have to solve the combination. But it's all okay because one of them can rewind time and brute force it. Tezuhiko fails once no matter what, but you have an 8% chance to one-shot it after him, and the game will still act as if you failed dozens of times. They unlock the door, which opens very, very slowly, and Yako jumps over it to kill Weska before you can even look inside. The fact that the door covers the camera is very indicative of the culprit using this time to enter. But again, since the game pulled the unfair trick of acting like the perpetrator was inside before this point, it's very difficult not to feel at odds with that conclusion. Presumably, Yaku knew that the door would open slowly because Yomi fed him information on the lab. But stabbing your mortal enemy a couple of times in the bag is a pretty inefficient way to ensure he dies. I don't know what's up with that. On the way out, he accidentally kicks the robot and hides in the air chamber before he can leave so that the hitman comes and stabs him. Once again, 
He predicts that his friends will make the brilliant decision of rushing inside with the criminal on the loose, instead of waiting outside to ambush the culprit with some help. That you will run away from being held at gunpoint by three machine guns, and that Fubuki's time travel will not be fast enough to save him, which is an extremely risky assumption. Halara and Vivia appear and save you from the peacekeepers. They can easily take down a group of peacekeepers with guns, but Yako didn't even make sure that Halara was with us during his trick, so he basically left us to deal with a bunch of peacekeepers who nearly killed us. After sweeping the floor with peacekeepers who outnumbered us, the game still insists on treating them as a threat that we should hide from. This is something the game clearly abuses the whole time. It flip-flops between treating the peacekeepers as a deadly threat and as complete pushovers depending on what's more convenient. Instead of knocking out the peacekeepers and rushing to take Yako out of the lab to treat him, they just lock themselves in a room for no reason. Also, no one asks why his blood is pink. The only thing they come up with is to investigate what happened and convince the peacekeepers to let us go. In particular, the person who bombed us a couple of chapters ago. Anyway, someone finally brings up Vivia's power in chapter 4. You turn into a ghost sleepwalker, there is some riveting ghost gameplay, and you investigate the doctor's room. The game gives you two pointless solution keys that I kept thinking about the whole chapter. The canned food and the ceiling vent. I don't mind that not every solution key is used, but this vent one feels like another desperate attempt to make you think that the murder was committed before you unlock the security system. Also, where are the human meat buttons? Reminder that the doctor is a homunculus, so wouldn't he be craving them? Is that human canned meat? I don't know, but the peacekeepers say that they may have to quickly take the corpse away because they brought past in the rain. I don't know if I'm the only one who doesn't see the rain here. Also, goddamn, this game needs to stop lying. Yuma finds one footprint on the robot. Where is the second footprint? This one was left when Yako was writing it, but he had two shoes. Why does only one get marked? Maybe some people won't agree, but I see this as another shameless way to hide the truth from the player. It's extremely unnatural that only one footprint would be visible, and the game passes it off as a mark that was left when the culprit bumped against the robot. It's really, really rough. I really don't feel like this chapter gives fair information to the player. I remember thinking how unnatural it was to kick the top of the robot, and also how dumb it is since it's basically a cylinder that could roll and point the camera to the culprit, but no, it's just a misleading piece of evidence. The other footprint evaporated. This is when Vivi lets on that the truth is hiding something cruel and hard to accept. I really dislike it when games do this. Pointing to the nature of the truth is far more revealing than writers seem to think. At this point, thanks to the game's gaslighting, I was very uncertain of what had happened. But when the game revealed that the truth would be somber and difficult, my reaction was, oh, was it Yako? Not because of any deduction, but just because of how indicative Vivia's tone is. It turns out that despite Yako's whole plan, Vivia solved it on intuition and because Yako let ghost Vivia walk around while he plotted things. When Vivia is dead set on forbidding Yuma from discovering the truth, Yako's soul speaks up and tells them not to hide away from the truth. This is later framed as a touching moment when you discover what he had done, and even at present it's Yako's will before dying. But it just cannot help but feel like it's way too contradictory to be moving. He just went through an elaborate plot to kill his enemy and then obscured his death so as not to reveal that he died from the 30 minute gas. He does this solely so that his friends don't realize that he killed the doctor. He wasn't trying to trick the peacekeepers. But right away, he tells us to pursue the truth. It's very difficult to accept as if he's atoning when it's an instant flip right after the crime. But either way, my biggest gripe is how telling this whole exchange is. Next to where Yako died, you find two pieces of evidence, neither of which makes any sense. One of them is a blurred picture that clearly shows Yako with a woman, and the other one is a map of the lab. The photo is there because the hitman was not even given proper instructions and left behind a photo of the real target. Why does he usually do that? Why was he instructed to trigger the blackout, to kill Yako at the perfect time, to not mind the multiple death threats under his name, but not something as important as not leaving a photo that points to the real target? As for the map, I'll get to it later when it's more relevant. You return to your body and have not concluded anything. You need more info that you can only gather with your corporeal self. Something that seriously shocked me is how the game insists on making Yuma feel useless, as if he's been relying on others all along and he must do things on his own for once. It makes such a big deal out of it and it becomes a big part of his character arc when it couldn't be more wrong. It's the others who haven't done anything the whole game. Yuma's gone through insane logic leaps any chance he's had, but he's been the only one to solve things. Everyone is in the lab because Yako brought them in while Yuma is the only one who made it on his own merits. Shaming him like he must overcome the way he keeps relying on others was completely baffling to me. What's the game blaming him for? For not being able to avoid the crazy machine gun police without Fubuki's time travel? 
He was still the one who solved it all out of nowhere. Same in chapter 2, and in chapter 1, Halara just chose to be difficult and not share their thoughts. They need to go to the doctor's computer and open the security locks. Why does Halara not go when they can knock out every peacekeeper on the way? Because everyone else is useless, so Yuma has to take the reins again and go alone. Before though, you're given two solution keys out of the blue regarding Vivius and Fubuki's powers, which spell out that they were used for the crime. This was the moment things started to fall into place for me. Yet again, not because I used the clues the game provides to infer conclusions, but because of how telling solution keys can be sometimes. It's time for the peacekeepers to be pushovers again, so you reach the critical lab alone. You don't even bring Fubuki to rewind time for you. On the doctor's PC, you confirm that the security system was only disabled when you used the robot to unlock it, and that the last time it was unlocked was 90 days ago. If you take Weska's act at face value, there is still a way he could have been stabbed before you used the robot, if the killer was in the critical lab for 90 days. It sounds absurd, but I cannot know what's going on there, and it was a viable solution. But don't worry, because the game will take the liberty to say that it's impossible that the crime was committed before you unlock the system. It's also pretty amusing to see the game trying to justify that Wesker's PC isn't password protected because only he can be in the lab. Yeah, right. Remember that he was about to swap places with your melted corpse? Yeah, he planned to escape the city while leaving his PC without a password. Anyway, Vivia comes to save you because it's his time to enjoy the mystery labyrinth, and you've already learned how much it helps while being surrounded by armed officers. Vivia is not so interested in banter, so you may think this labyrinth could get straight to the point, but you still have to go through a deathmatch or you have to prove your innocence thanks to evidence you memorized instead of by saying, I didn't kill Weska, so that proves I didn't kill him, which, like I said in the previous section, should be no different from evidence the labyrinth accepts just because you witnessed it. Then you say that the culprit must have hidden in the air chamber compartment, and you're siphoned straight to the time-wasting room. This is a room strictly designed to waste your time. It has four options on how the culprit could have entered the lab, and all of them are wrong. In order to progress, the game forces you to pick something as idiotic as the activated security by cutting power, which has already been established to not have happened a hundred times. Never entered in the first place directly contradicts the previous deathmatch where you said that someone bumping into the robot proved there was an intruder. But here, what you use to establish that this option is wrong is that the doctor couldn't have committed suicide by stabbing himself three times in the back, which is just not true if you're committed enough. After the game's had enough making you run around like a headless chicken, Vivia repeats the can you handle the truth, have you really not figured it out yet, and look, I can at least appreciate what they're setting up here. They're exhausting all the possible answers to zero in on the fact that it appears like an impossible crime, but again, it only looks like it because of the doctor's unfair act. Fortunately, it's time to unveil the trick, and the game does so in the most blatant example of the labyrinth spoon-feeding you the answer. You have no idea how the culprit entered the lab, so you're randomly presented with the possibility that the doctor was not actually yelling at anyone on the intercom. You pick it with no evidence whatsoever, and the labyrinth confirms that it's correct. Zero deduction, zero evidence, it's just given to you. At least you would think now it's evident that the doctor was killed when you opened the door with the robot, but the next stretch of the labyrinth is surreal. A Shinigami puzzle establishes that a way to reach the lab is with the robot. Everything lines up for the answer, and surely the player is bound to realize it here, but the characters spend a good half an hour failing to consider it. This took me straight back to Danganronpa 2's best case, where eventually in the trial the game implies what the twist is gonna be, you realize what it's getting at, but before actually getting there, there is 20 minutes or so where the characters fail to pick up what the game is putting down and consider far less interesting options. It's exactly the same thing here. You figure out the doctor's nonsensical acid scheme, and by figure out I mean you pull it out of your ass based on a drawing he had lying around, you say the culprit entered before the robot, which is the only possibility. You solve a spot selection, which by the way is awfully worded. Where was the culprit before the crime was committed? Depending on what it means by before, every answer is correct. Before stabbing the doctor, he was in the same room as him. Before that, he was in the panel room. Before that, he was in the gas chamber. And before that, he was in the air chamber, which is the right answer. So the game means, where was the culprit before the crime was committed, but not exactly before the crime was committed. Then there is another question that just stunlocked me. How did the culprit use the robot? As a weapon, as a shield, or neither? Both as a weapon and as a shield should be valid depending on how much you stretch the definition, but the right answer is neither, and then you're brought back to the previous question. It's a lot of dragged out back and forth, but at least this is the only time in the game where the labyrinth feels sort of like a labyrinth, and here they finally consider that the culprit used your robot to enter the lab, which is what I thought the game was getting at half an hour ago. 
There is a very, very obvious conclusion to draw from this, but the game won't get to it right away, will it? Instead, you get a deathmatch with Yomi where he says that the doctor would have heard the door opening and wouldn't have been stabbed in the back. And you cannot refute running is noisy with the doctor was deaf. The ambiguity regarding which statement to counter is at its worst in this chapter. And if someone wants to argue, you're technically not refuting that running is noisy, only that the doctor wouldn't have heard the noise, then feel free, but anyone's reaction upon reading running is noisy would be to say that it doesn't matter because the doctor was deaf. So being so picky on which statement to counter with less than a second to think makes these death matches feel like busy work. The very, very obvious conclusion regards the culprit's identity. If the plan was to use our robot to enter the lab, then the culprit must have known about Fubuki's powers and taken advantage of them. I remember thinking, okay, the game is sidestepping bringing this up because it wants to leave the culprit reveal for later. But instead, they reveal that Yako is the culprit by saying, the culprit would die 30 minutes after being exposed to the gas chamber, so it's gotta be Yako and he obscured his death with the hitman. I'm not twisting the game's words or anything. This is how it reveals that Yako is the culprit. It's not even logic. Why couldn't the real hitman have killed the doctor and Yako and then gone off screen to die from the gas? Again, there is logic to frame Yako as the culprit, but that's not it. The real logic is brought up in the scene where Bivia challenges you, which is a pretty good scene, but it's way too late to bring up something so crucial. The game does try to remedy this, and I wish it didn't, because what it says is that Yuma kinda knew all along, about Fubuki's forte being taken advantage of, about the culprit's identity, but that he subconsciously suppressed it, which is why the labyrinth never got to the point of who the culprit was. This is just a subjective opinion, but I'm very fed up with media pulling this card. He suppressed the truth? No, he didn't. This guy was totally clueless when he hopped into the labyrinth. And I can only see this as a poor excuse to structure the labyrinth in the game's preferred way, omitting direct conclusions until it wants to lift the curtain. In this scene, other than saying that the blackout made us use the robot, which isn't true like I said earlier, you also say that Yaku sent the death threat to the peacekeepers to be able to use Desuhiko's disguise to infiltrate. Are we forgetting about the hitman? How did he infiltrate then? He wasn't disguised, so clearly using Desuhiko's ability wasn't required. Well, the confession scene is good, the comic book song fits perfectly, and the labyrinth's end is by far the greatest emotional hide in the game because just having the slightest attachment to the characters involved is far more engaging than dealing with these losers. The plan, while surrounded by contrivances and insanity, still manages to be pretty striking. I have to say, I do have a slight gripe with the way the game downplays Yaku's betrayal. He basically uses his friends and leaves them to die in the hands of the peacekeepers, and is too much of a coward to own up to his actions, so he disguises his death just so that his friends don't find out what he did, immediately changing his mind in ghost form. Also, he didn't expect Yuma to be in the lab, so the last time you casually see him in the submarine is the last time he thought he would see you. He went to the lab to die and wasn't planning on talking to you again, which makes Yuma's emotion feel slightly one-sided. Maybe even more so considering that from the start of the game, Yako knew about the secret lab and the shady business going on but didn't say a word. The game relies on emphasizing over and over how Yako's resolve pushed him to die to the electrical shocks, when, all things considered, he could have hopped off the robot, stayed out of the camera's view in the gas chamber and avoided getting shocked, but that's a very minor point. What's harder to believe is that Yako really thought he had to die to kill the doctor. The agency's goal was to investigate the lab. Surely he could have disguised himself and brought Fubuki and Asuhiko to the doctor, come up with the robot method of figuring out the panel password, and made up an excuse like, we will come back with the others at a better time. Then, as soon as all it takes to bypass the gas chamber and kill the doctor without dying, or piloting the robot yourself with a bomb in it, I don't know. It sounds convoluted, but his plan was far more convoluted, so I can't help but feel like he chose to die. It's fine, I can accept Yaku's actions, but I would be lying if I said that it all perfectly meshes together in my head. Anyway, you're not done yet. There is one less mystery to solve before the labyrinth is satisfied. You infer the existence of a mastermind that controlled Yako because of the emails you saw on the doctor's computer. No, there is no relation whatsoever between the emails and Yako having been manipulated by a mastermind, but the game says there is just because it's too coincidental that Yako committed the crime when the doctor was planning to flee. Okay. A blurred mystery phantom appears and says that there is nothing connecting the email sender to Yako, which you refute with the map you found next to Yako's body because it's the only piece of evidence you haven't used yet. The rationale is that Yako had a map only Yomi had access to, revealing that Yomi is the mastermind that instigated Yako to commit the crime. This is ridiculous for so many reasons. First, you're assuming that Yako was the one who threw the map away just because it was close to his body when it could have been thrown by the hitman. 
Second, you're supposed to believe that the workers aren't allowed to map of their workplace, and the only exhibit is kept in a room only the director has access to. Third, that instead of memorizing the simple layout at home, Yako brought the map to the lab, and after getting stabbed, he realized he should throw it away next to him. I'll say, the fact that Yomi was portrayed as a mastermind was strange to me. Up to that point, I had come to think about him as a branded and unhinged impulsive man. Not a calculating mastermind plotting a detailed scheme in the shadows, but I guess that's on me. Please bear with me though, because this makes no sense. Yomi admits to having manipulated Yako into killing the doctor. How exactly did he think he would accomplish that? All he does is write to Yako saying that the doctor killed his wife, provides the map and presumably some details like the hiding spot in the air chamber and the way the door opens. How exactly are you manipulating Yako into killing the doctor when he was only able to kill the doctor because one of his friends can travel back in time? The same friend that you tried to kill when she was entering the city. And if you want to give the game the benefit of the doubt and assume that before chapter 0, which is when Yako received the letters, Yomi already knew that Fubuki existed and could travel back in time, why in the world does he bomb the submarine in chapter 2? This Yomi is actually the mastermind section is a really weak end to the labyrinth, and considering he admits to having plotted the doctor's death and assisted in the execution by sending the map, why does the labyrinth not kill him when it killed the three girls in chapter 2 for conspiring and assisting to Karin's death? It's worth bringing attention to, to say the least, because if there is a difference, then it's paper thin. Out of the labyrinth, it's pretty nice to see Vipia sitting against Yomi, but not as nice as reading Solving the case didn't help anything for the fifth time. You're about to be executed, but I'm pretty sure these peacekeepers don't actually know how their weapons work. At the last moment, Makoto joins the fun. He has a dossier with documents. Yomi has two machine guns. Who do you think will win? It's actually Makoto because Yomi's guns literally disappear. I'm not making it up, they disappear from one shot to the next. And he instructs his minions to kill Makoto instead, who refuse to obey because the masked man is threatening or something. Not gonna lie, I don't actually get it. Even if Makoto has compromising documents, these peacekeepers spend the whole game following orders because it's their job, not out of loyalty. In this chapter's investigation, you overhear two peacekeepers who are considering selling evidence. It's pretty clear that they're not brainwashed into believing Yomi is a saint, and when they find out that he's involved in shady schemes, their admiration for him shatters and they stop obeying his commands. Maybe I'm supposed to believe that Makoto's authority is more imposing in this situation, but it comes across as a pretty convenient way to wrap things up. Also, is Yomi a homunculus or a human being? Do they arrest him instead of killing him because his blood would be red? Or is it sequel bait? It was very strange to me that there is no final climax with Yomi and he doesn't appear again after this point. That was fairly underwhelming with how much of a pest he is the whole game. Here is where you consider that Makoto was using you all along in order to get rid of Yomi. This could make sense, but the game doesn't bother to make it make sense. Makoto's plan, from the beginning, was to use you to get rid of Yomi by making you expose his dealings with Dr. Weska. He only brought you to the lab because you inquired about it, but at that time he said he was already planning to take you to it, which Yuma shrugged off. So it basically worked out perfect for Makoto by chance, but what I don't understand is what he thinks he needs you for. Chapter 5 reveals that Makoto is essentially Yuma's clone and that he has the same capable brain. So what can Yuma do that Makoto can't? Makoto could easily expose Yomi himself, but he chose to be lazy and delegate the job to Yuma without filling him in. In Chapter 5, he says that his plan was always to use Yuma, but it just so happened that you asked to go to the lab when Yako had lured the peacekeepers which let Makoto sneak into Yomi's office when he was out and procure compromising documents. Yuma didn't contribute to that whatsoever. All Makoto needed was for Yomi to be out of his office, so the game feels completely flat when it claims that Makoto expertly manipulated Yuma for his own needs. In the end, Yuma wasn't needed at all, and it was as simple as sneaking into Yomi's office. Also, Martina's still alive if anyone cares. There are many things that make me unable to call this chapter great, but it's far and away the most compelling one so far, just because it has enough highest to stand up for itself, and it's the only one that, when I think back on it, the good aspects manage to partially outshine the cons, more so than it happens with Chapter 2. That's mostly a result of working with a far more captivating premise, directly relating to the main cast and overarching plot beats, and sticking the landing far better than every case so far. Bibia is an alright companion. I don't really like that he has the whole case basically solved from the start, it gives away a lot and you never feel like he's on your side. But he's the only companion that goes through palpable growth, denoting how much of a mistake it is to make the other characters forget the labyrinth's events. I also thought that this was the first chapter where Shinigami was a pleasing companion. 
She seems to have warmed up to you and offers a better balance between useless comments and actually talking about what's going on. She apologizes when jokes go over the line and seems a bit more humane overall. All in all, I feel very similar about how we feel about the RB3's best case. It's the one I'm the most on board with, but it's still marred by a lot of nonsense, and it's definitely not immune to the labyrinth's same old abysmal pace. By the way, Halara says that they investigated the restricted area and didn't find the secret lab, but how is that possible? How did they not find the zombies and the human meat factory? No idea, but number one calls the agency and reveals that the global mystery is a mass kidnapping case. Thanks for not saying that at the beginning of the game. And then he gets blown up, which serves him right. Vivia mentions he overheard the phrase, blank with mystery, which will turn out to be the funniest plot you've ever read. And Makoto's gift releases sleeping gas, which Kurumi inhales too because they leave the submarine open or something. It's finally time for the game to the rail. To unload on you a truck full of exposition dumps and twists made in Japan that will blow your socks off. You will learn the reason behind the endless rain, who's behind the mask, and you will go through 95% of the instances of the word homunculus in literature. The execution of this chapter is pretty peculiar. It's a 5 hour long exposition dump from start to finish. The game literally kidnaps you and bombards you with information until everything has been resolved. Kodaka's plots have always been very eccentric, so you will be surprised to a degree. None of the twists stray much from the usual Kodaka flair, but it's always fun to see what borderline nonsense plots these games have come up with. And while the shameless exposition dumps make this chapter feel far less organic than the others and puts an abrupt end to the game, I'm not opposed to this method of filling every gap and it helped with not permeating the final chapter with the game's usual glacial pace. As for the actual execution, the revelations themselves, the conclusion, that's a different story. Makoto takes your unconscious body to the restricted area. Kurumi is there too. Why? I don't know. She was knocked out by chance. Surely Makoto didn't predict that, so I don't know why he brought her along when he locked the other detectives away. I gotta preface this section by saying that I understand certain plot points about this chapter far less than I do for the others. The game leaves a few things ambiguous, presents conflicting information, and only tiptoes around certain topics, so I can't speak very confidently. I don't know why Makoto brings Kurumi along, maybe there is a reason, but I didn't find it in the chapter. To begin with, why does Makoto bring you to the restricted area? Even that crucial question isn't explained in detail. Through the chapter, he lectures you on everything you would want to know and more, and then he tries to kill you at the end, claiming that was his plan all along because he wants to take over the WDO as your clone. Why didn't he just kill you when you were unconscious then? He says it's because he wants to kill you in the mystery labyrinth not to leave traces, but in all seriousness, that's not a satisfying reason. Then, the game pulls the card that Makoto wanted his crimes to be exposed all along, which is why he turned you around. But that's less of a satisfying reason, considering every single thing he's done and considering he was extremely close to really killing you on many occasions. After all, notice where you wake up. In the middle of nowhere, very far from the factory where he's waiting to lecture you on his life story. On the way, you find zombies who kill you if you fail QTEs, so why does he put you in so much danger if he wanted you to expose him or if he wanted to kill you in the labyrinth? You might have missed an optional bit of dialogue in this chapter that reveals that the hitman who killed Jacko in chapter 4 was killed by Makoto afterward. He was the one who pressured him to accept Jacko's job and then he knew too much. So, 24 hours ago, Makoto cold-heartedly killed a man he manipulated, but the conclusion of this chapter attempts to hint that in reality he wanted Yuma to expose his crimes. Straight up, it's very hard for me to reconcile Makoto's actions with the game's portrayal of his character, which was an underlying conflict I felt all over the chapter. But let's be real, that's not really the point, is it? This chapter is all about the mindless roller coaster the game shoves you on. Everyone in the city was a homunculus from a field experiment from three years ago. The clouds are artificially fabricated to keep UV rays at bay, and every real human who lived in the city was murdered by the homunculi going rampage. I'll give it to the game, I had fun playing this chapter, it goes straight to business and does all it can to entertain you, but the extent to which you have to shut your brain off to accept a single thing it says is unreal. You find zombies who want to eat you. They're the same characters you met through the whole game, who, after dying, were tossed into the restricted area, and 24 hours later, they revived with even less intelligence. First of all, since Yaku is already a zombie, and homunculite revive after 24 hours, it means that you were knocked out for a pretty crazy amount of time. After dying, homunculi spend 24 hours dead, so why do they not cremate them instead of leaving them to zombify and suffer miserably in the restricted area? 
you eventually find a factory that manufactures meat buns which are made out of human flesh and given to the citizens in order to survive. People may be inclined to complain that the twists are just cheap shock value, lacking depth or meaning other than offering spectacle, but I don't mind, I signed up to be entertained. What I do mind is how the game sets up this dark situation. The citizens have to eat death row inmates in order to survive, and then distorts it all at the end to fabricate a happy ending out of a premise that shouldn't allow for one. You're not solving a problem if your solution is saying that there was no problem in the first place, and this chapter does this every time it needs to resolve anything. You start learning bits and pieces about Kanai Ward's story, which were left behind in memos written by your friend detectives. I would like to know why Makoto makes Yuma think that his friends were even alive, leaving their clothing behind, which by the way they somehow still have at the end of the game. Is Makoto trying to break Yuma down? Because, sincerely, this comes across as a fairly unfair attempt to trick the player once more by making you think that their blood is pink, which threw my theory at the time for a loop. Somehow, and I mean somehow, you recognize without a doubt that the handwriting in these notes belongs to your four friends that you've known for a week and whose handwriting you've probably never seen before. These notes detail what happened in the experiments and hint at the bigger picture. It's seriously stunning how this section doesn't try to be more than an info dump. There is a point where Kurumi goes missing and Yuma literally shrugs it off to go to the secret lab, only remembering 30 minutes later that Kurumi exists. In the secret lab you find Delta, Amaterasu's old CEO. This part is crazy unless I'm missing something. His eyes are bleeding pink, so he's a homunculus. My question would be, why exactly did they make a homunculus out of the CEO if not for a far more important question? Which, to tackle, I've gotta talk about the Blankwick mystery, one of the most insane plots I've ever read. Three years ago, the world's unified government created the first successful homunculus from the DNA of the greatest mind. Number one, a detective from the WDO, also known as Yuma before he gave up his memories. He has the world's largest brain, but didn't see this one coming. Pressured by the success of their rival, Amaterasu's research rushed an experiment to create their own successful homunculus, and to do so, they ordered every citizen to take a blood test. Then, they created a homunculus out of every single DNA sample, which, upon breaking out of its pod, went insane due to sunlight shining into the lab. The experiment was a failure. Every homunculus exposed to sunlight went berserk and managed to break out of the lab. In just a week, they killed every single human being in the city. Number One's homunculus realized he was a homunculus, somehow broke out of his lab, and he was drawn to Kanai Ward after discovering that it had more homunculi like him. He had the brilliant idea of covering the deadly laser with a blanket in exchange for becoming the CEO of Amaterasu, which calmed the homunculi down and created the endless rain. When the citizens woke up, they didn't know about the week in which they had killed every human being, and this period became known as the Blank Week Mystery which somehow became taboo so that you don't hear about it until the end of the game. That's how the game narrates things. There is so much to unpack that I don't even know where to start. You might start off asking yourself, why did they want to create a homunculus? Well, it's because they wanted them to be immortal and contribute to the military as an immortal army. That should be enough to make you turn off your brain until the end of the chapter. They started this research 10 years ago to create an army of humans who wouldn't die a trivial death but would still die after getting blown up. It's ridiculous, maybe invest in nuclear weapons, bioweapons, or something that will actually be useful. Anyway, they went all out and extracted DNA from every citizen. I wonder, could you not create multiple homunculi from one person by taking multiple DNA samples? I suppose they were looking for app DNA and that's why they had to test the whole city, but the way the game says things makes this a bit unclear. If your goal is to create an army, but only very select humans have the needed aptitude, you're gonna have an army of three people unless you really can create multiples out of a single person, which the game never talks about. Doesn't matter because none of them work, and they all go insane because there is a huge hole in the lab ideal for satellite espionage and for intruders to break in. When they recap the events at the end, the hole is a dome instead. I'm guessing that's a mistake, because the game says that the hole might have been intentional to test if the sunlight weakness existed in this wave of homunculi. This means that they knew it could exist and chose to expose them all at once, knowing that if they were defective, they would go insane. So they go insane, obliterate the lab's shutter, and kill every single human being in Kanai Ward. And I mean every single human being. Not one human was able to survive by locking themselves in a room. They got every single one of them, but the humans were pathetically useless and didn't fight back, so none of the homunculi died. A week later, Makoto comes up with the idea of creating artificial clouds with a machine that I probably don't have to mention is completely unrealistic. Also, they say that the homunculi have an allergic reaction to UV rays, which go through clouds, but okay. This gives Makoto the Amaterasu CEO position and every homunculus wakes up. 
That's as far as I can say, because it's all the game says. Kurumi says that they woke up one week later. She makes it sound as if they woke up in their beds, which makes no sense. They would have all woken up in the middle of nowhere unless they were manually escorted to their beds. Where is all the blood and human corpses? I don't know, I don't think it's mentioned either, so you have to assume that someone retrieved them all. All the homunculi had memories of when they were human, so the game is saying that memory is stored in the DNA. That's the recap for you. It should go without saying that it's a plot designed to be shocking or coherent. If you intend to take it seriously, calling it absurd would be a euphemism. Now, back to Delta. He's the one who tells you that he agreed to give Makoto the CEO position in exchange for putting an end to the Blackwick mystery. If I point out again that the pink blood reveals he's a homunculus, surely you will notice the contradiction. Makoto was drawn to Kane Ward because it was filled with homunculi. This guy is a homunculus who gave Makoto the CEO position, who put an end to the homunculus research. In other words, the CEO's homunculus couldn't have been created after that point, which means that he gave Makoto the CEO position while being a homunculus, and while being unaffected by the sunlight during the blank week mystery. This is such a big oversight that I have to assume I'm missing some piece of information, but I don't know what it is. Anyway, after stepping off the CEO position, Yomi killed him for appointing Makoto instead of killing Makoto, which is an outstanding move. Further into the lab, you see the machine with every pot and the sun shining in. Let me say, there is no way you've walked a sufficient distance to have left the clouds. You would also think that you would see the huge steam swirling into the sky at the center of the clouds from anywhere, but I guess these are no big deal. Yaku Zombie gives you a disc that presumably Makoto gave to him, which shows the real Dr. Weska getting killed, and by killed I mean he gets smacked and later the game says it clearly showed him dying. I'll say it again, big shoutouts to the pathetic security they had in place. Well, you leave, find Kurumi again, see the death row convicts up for processing and reach the machine that's producing the artificial clouds. There you find Makoto, who must have ran away from the rumor he was guiding you around. He wants you to hop into the mystery labyrinth and he's very smart, so he knows that pointing a gun to you is all it takes for you to go to the labyrinth. You're finally ready to put every clue together and expose Kanye Ward's darkness. I've gotta hand it to the game, this is the best realized labyrinth in terms of show. I really like the song and the explosive way the game reveals certain details, so it's a shame that the plot you're uncovering is nothing to rave about. First, the labyrinth takes on some pleasing shapes and warms up with basic questions. You also battle against Makoto's Phantom, who's given the name box Yuma's Phantom. I never like it when games UI lies to you. There is even a tape that lies about number one's real identity, which is unfortunate. The stakes don't rise until Shinigami places a barrel on the stairs that somehow doesn't roll off and prompts you to reveal that all the citizens were replaced, or switched, or swapped, or exchanged, or substituted. I really wish they would leave this minigame for words that don't have a bunch of valid synonyms. You solve the Blankwick mystery in chronological order and detail the specifics behind the homunculus characteristics. Yuma considers that the pink blood might have been an intended distinguishing trait to tell apart homunculi from human beings, which, if true, would be hilarious. Instead of a mark in the neck, they made their blood pink so they have to slice them up to tell them apart from humans. Here is also where they say that everyone thought blood was supposed to be red. They assumed the rain turned it pink and they were actually making extremely ambiguous remarks about it all along. After a brief comic book overview, the real Makoto appears with a solution blade. The game says that he has the blade because, before entering the labyrinth, he used coalescence on Yuma and copied Shinigami's ability. So he's allowed a sword when Shinigami said that the other master detectives who Yuma used coalescence on couldn't wield one. I don't know, in chapter 1, the explanation for coalescence says that you need permission to activate the ability, but Makoto activates it without Yuma's permission. There is a lot here that seems to work the way that works best for the game like Makoto being able to enter the labyrinth because he shook Yuma's hand, when in chapter 2, as far as I remember, Yuma never shook Nezuhiko's hand. There is more. Shinigami says that if Yuma stays forever in the labyrinth, the labyrinth will dissolve, killing Yuma, which will break coalescence and kick Makoto out of the labyrinth alive. In every other chapter, Shinigami said that the companion master detective would also be stuck in the labyrinth forever. And how was Makoto planning to kill you in the labyrinth and then escape without solving it, which would kill him? None of this is made clear. Minor details, I guess, and I could have something mixed up. I think this part with Makoto is really well realized. The labyrinth spectacle is at its best. You slowly crack Makoto's masks until you see his face and uncover his identity. But first let me ask, why does he wear a mask? Other than to leave this reveal for the final chapter, I mean. You may want to say that he's hiding his face so that you don't realize that he looks like you, but that can't be it. It can't be it because that would imply he's starting wearing the masks when you were deployed to the city, which is not the case because then Yomi would recognize you. 
Nobody does, meaning that Makoto is always wearing the masks. The next theory could be that when he realized he was a homunculus, he started wearing the masks because he didn't have a real identity. But isn't there a problem there? Makoto was made out of Number One's DNA. He has his brain, and most importantly, he should have Number One's memories. Every single Kanai Ward homunculus was an exact replica of how they were as humans, keeping their memories and character. So how come Makoto turns out to be such a different character compared to what you see of Number One? It's not a minor difference. I get that events influence you, but Number One was willing to give up on himself in the name of happiness, while Makoto is a psycho who killed the hitman he manipulated to get rid of Yomi. I don't know, but at this point in the game, Makoto's face reveal comes with the obvious implication that you're the real Number One, the greatest detective in the world. And, of course, only a brain this large could have figured out that the three girls were accomplices. The number one you talked to on the phone was a fake, and his explosion was a fabrication too. I don't know the reason for this either, really. Everything surrounding Makoto's actions is very blurry to me. Makoto makes everyone watch a fake explosion before knocking them out. Why does he make us think the number one died? He doesn't kill the master detectives for knowing too much about Chapter 4's events even though he killed the hitman. So why does the fake number one, who's in cahoots with Makoto, say that we should investigate a mass kidnapping case after they accomplish their goal and right before a fake explosion? There is a lot in Makoto's actions, as well as in the WDO's actions, that I cannot make any sense of. There was something in particular that confused me to no end at first. When they revealed Yuma's identity as number one, Makoto explains that number one swapped identities with a real boy named Yuma to enter Kanai Ward in disguise, but he says that the real Yuma didn't expect number one to go to Kanai Ward after this exchange. This contradicts the explanation itself, and I'm pretty sure it's a mistranslation. The original line should be saying that number one didn't expect the real Yuma to go to Kanai Ward after him, which is actually consistent. Now, as for the plan to swap identities and forget his own memories, I can't say it makes any sense to me. There is a line that says that number one discovered that they had made a homunculus out of him, which is what drove him to go to Kanai Ward. So, changing your name is not gonna do anything. Your homunculus that you're searching for will recognize you, and anyone involved with the research will too. Calling yourself Yuma is not gonna do anything. By erasing your memories, you're helping your cause even less. Number one didn't actually need Shinigami's powers for anything, let alone having the world's largest brain. By erasing his memories, he makes it so he almost dies on the way to the city and forgets his mission of seeking out his homunculus. If he didn't erase them and enter the city safely, he could have known right away. So, on top of Makoto's actions being hazy, number one's also are. He basically kills his own self and makes his amnesiac self hop on a deadly train. He says he needs Shinigami's powers because in Kanai Ward the truth gets distorted, but the truth still gets distorted with Shinigami around and he loses focus on his original goal. You may be able to keep all of this stuff consistent with enough assumptions, but there is one point that in my opinion has no justification and makes this confrontation lose a lot of strength. I'm talking about the revelation that the WDO deployed the master detectives to oust Yomi. This makes so little sense and is such a big deal in the grand scheme of things that it really stands out to me. To expel Yomi, they deployed their top-class detectives, killed 80% of them in the process, were not needed to expel Yomi in the end, and the game still tries to make you think that they were masterfully taking advantage of. All it took was for Yomi to be out of his office and grab some documents that his army of peacekeepers didn't even read before betraying him. What did you need the master detectives for? To begin with, it's very hard to swallow that Makoto couldn't just kill Yomi. It's also very hard to swallow that he couldn't oust him himself in three years. But what is impossible to swallow is that they needed to deploy a bunch of detectives who were not given any direction and ended up contributing nothing. Fubuki's power was used for Yako to send a death threat, but if all you need is for Yomi to be distracted, you don't need top-class detectives. Yuma figuring out Yomi's schemes in the Chapter 4 labyrinth didn't help whatsoever, and to top it off, Makoto perfectly orchestrated everything and predicted that Yomi's bomb would be non-lethal, that Martina wouldn't shoot us, that we would escape from the peacekeepers every time. It's so extremely contrived that I cannot take it seriously. Next, the game wants to present a moral dilemma regarding Makoto's character. He was kidnapping criminals soon to be executed to turn them into food because otherwise the homunculi would die. For this, the game emphasizes that Makoto really loves the city and its citizens because they're all homunculi like him. But this doesn't work either. It's written in a way where you would think that he goes to these lengths because he has no choice and would do anything for the city he loves. But reading the optional dialogue that reveals that he killed the Chapter 4 hitman breaks that illusion. He killed one of his beloved homunculi after instigating him to agree to Yako's plan, all to kick Yomi out. If you just read the labyrinth, you would almost think that Makoto is an angel who wouldn't hurt a fly if he didn't have to. 
At least the way I see it, there is a significant dissonance between how the labyrinth portrays him and what he did out of camera. Once again making me wish that this evident effort to create a thrilling conclusion had been used with a more coherent plot. I may be getting too negative, but my least favorite thing is still to come and I mentioned it earlier. First you go through a sequence where you throw your own statements at Makoto, which he cannot refute. It's a nice concept, but it goes on for way too long and the volume control is a tragedy. This is where you get to the resolution. You can solve the labyrinth, which would kill Makoto, the culprit behind the mass kidnapping, or stay and let Makoto go, which again may be a bit inconsistent with how coalescence has been described before, but no huge deal. Everything has been deliberately set up so that there is no happy solution. If you solve the labyrinth, Makoto will die, whom the game insists is actually a decent person who wanted you to expose him. In the real world, there is no happy solution because if death row inmates stop getting abducted, Kana Ward citizens will die. No matter which option you pick, Yuma comes up with a third answer, which is to let Makoto out and let the citizens solve the mystery in the real world by deciding how to proceed, which will kill Yuma in the labyrinth. Basically, Yuma wants to ask the citizens, Hi, as the failed experiment that you are, would you rather keep eating human flesh that we're obtaining illegally or die? That's his brilliant solution. He thinks that if the mystery is solved in the real world, the mystery labyrinth will disappear and kill him. Why does he think that? I don't know. The labyrinth is separated from time in the real world. Whenever you enter a labyrinth, time stops in reality, so I don't know why he expects that Makoto solving the mystery in the future relative to the labyrinth will affect it. It means that any time you enter a labyrinth, you're in danger of someone solving the mystery in reality and killing you. Either way, as much as Yuma's solution of letting the citizens decide their future is a bit of a reach, there is sacrifice in it. Something needs to be sacrificed in the real world, and Yuma needs to sacrifice himself in the labyrinth in favor of Makoto, so it's fine. But no. Right after establishing the tight rules that make this a difficult decision, the game presents a couple aspals and bends them like it's nothing. Don't worry, no sacrifice is needed in reality. If the citizens put on sunscreen, the sunlight doesn't affect them anymore. And after being told they have to eat human meat to survive, they just decide it's not for them anymore. Also, yeah, Yuma sacrificed in the labyrinth, but actually Doraemon comes to rescue him with the emergency exit they mentioned in chapter 1 that was obviously going to be used at the end. Why does the game waste my time with a dilemma that has no perfect outcome, makes the main character muster the resolve to give up his life and choose the best out of two bad options, only to throw it all out of the window because it wants a good ending? Not having the guts to stick to your own rules is the cheapest way to set up a dilemma, and I firmly dislike the resolution they chose. To at least offer a different form of sacrifice, in order to accept Doraemon's exit, Yuma has to give up on his memories of Shinigami, and he instantly agrees and has the most rushed farewell I've ever seen. He basically has no issues with leaving Shinigami behind, and Shinigami is suddenly a gentle and empathic character. Like I said, I did notice they made her more humane in Chapter 4. But considering that in Chapter 2, she completely lacked the empathy to understand why Yuma felt pity for the girls, this is still a very abrupt jump. And if I've learned anything about these games, giving up on his memories of Shinigami will be another wasted sacrifice because in the sequel he will be an edgelord who will remember everything. After the labyrinth vanishes, there is a surreal as hell episode where you control Kurumi and everyone has come to terms with the fact that there are homunculus who bleeds pink and was eating human meat. Everything is solved thanks to sunscreen and ramen, and half the NPCs say stuff like Oh, Makoto is so handsome. He's so smart and good looking. I love the guy who fed us death row convicts for three years. I've said it already, but it turns out that there was no problem to begin with. That's the conclusion. As for Yuma, he decided to disappear without saying anything because that's what main characters do before leading up to the sequel. In a note addressed to Kurumi, he says that he's gone off to solve all the world's mysteries and will come back for Shinigami once he's done that, but not before. Also, don't ask what happened to the zombies. I hope they're having it less rough. That's about it for Chapter 5. Credits roll and Yume abandons Shinigami and Kurumi to go save the United States. I might have been more harsh in this chapter because its strengths lie in the faster pacing, the labyrinth's production value, and the way some of the twists are delivered. I knew I was in for a crazy plot the moment I booted up a game by Kodaka, but personally speaking, I hoped it would go a bit more off the rails and my enjoyment was only derived from certain moments in the labyrinth thanks to the music and the visuals. The main twist, that everyone was a homunculus, is not that hard-hitting considering that during the game you're prone to considering something of the sort may be going on, but the rapid-fire revelations were able to keep me engaged, although I could associate almost every revelation with another piece of media that had done something very similar. In most discussions about the RB3 that I've seen, a lot of opinions are based on whether people like the ending or not. It's fairly divisive and a make-or-break point. 
There is a chance something similar happens here, where people put the focus on the end of the game to establish their feelings about it, but that's not what I would do. In the RP3 and in this game, I don't feel strongly about the ending one way or another. I see this game's ending as a supplement and as mindless fun to wrap things up. It could be more than mindless fun if you had an emotional attachment to the characters, but the game did the bare minimum to create that attachment. Personally, what I'm after are the individual cases, the detective work, clever and interesting plot ideas, that kind of stuff. I've said most of what I feel about the last chapter. It's a bunch of elaborate nonsense designed to get a reaction out of you with hopes that you were tricked. It's entertaining, but not the hook of the game, not why I was looking forward to playing a Danganronpa bootleg, and it has little influence on my overall thoughts. As for the whole package, there is little I've not said yet. I dissected the cases in detail to list out how many issues I had with the game, and especially because breaking them down sounded like a fun exercise. But some of these game's problems are so obvious that doing an in-depth dive is overkill. The insane amount of repetition, the deadly pace, the absurd, illogical or surreal parts, the predictability, the flaws behind the labyrinth's concept, the lack of times where characters shine through, going as far as to lock character interactions behind collectibles. I don't think these problems are difficult to identify, but I've still tried to explain why I think they're there until they find them in the chapters. There are plenty of issues I've not even had a chance to bring up. If you read some of the auto-advanced conversations without running at the same time, you're forced to go through the rest of the corridor in silence. Hidden walls and stopping triggers are spammed so much that sometimes you're afraid to look around. There is an over-reliance on stilted QTEs, the switch to pre-rendered cutscenes is so apparent that it can be jarring. There is no chemistry between Yuma and Shinigami in the first chapters, I could never get used to pause being mapped to plus and the menu being mapped to Y. The points where you can save are so stingy that from the middle of chapter 4's labyrinth to the very end I couldn't switch games because I couldn't save anywhere. There are so many flashbacks, some of which you can't skip. Dialogues are full of words and phrases that sound pretty unnatural in casual conversations, especially in throwaway dialogues with NPCs. Shinigami spends the whole game making jokes about how certain things are cliché when they indeed are cliché as if self-awareness is a remedy for it. Some investigations are far too long, half the time you want to click on an object, you click on another one that's nearby but farther away. Point is, the game is very rough around the edges, and while these issues sound minor, together they contribute to bringing the whole experience down. There are some positive points I've not had the chance to bring up either. The English VA is pretty good, especially Shinigami's, who could have easily had a shrill performance that wrecked the whole game. On the topic of Shinigami, I liked her, mainly in Pokemon form. She made me chuckle a couple of times, and the way they constantly animated her interacting with the world breathed some life into the game. The world design is well realized, and the soundtrack was able to sway me from thinking that it stood in the shadow of Danganronpa to appreciating it more thanks to a few standout tracks, although more than half of it is made out of Danganronpa soundalikes. Other than these, I already touched on the strong moments of the game in order, and even though there are not many of them, they managed to barely keep the game afloat. Much to the dismay of anyone who's watched this whole video, I don't hate this game. I'm all for games like this being made, and the fact that Spike tunes up is insistent on gathering feedback means there may be hope for a game that makes better use of this formula. There are aspects of this game that I seriously think hit rock bottom, but enjoyment is not one of them. It's fairly easy to get me on board with a detective game that's desperately trying to throw bombshells at you. If you still really enjoy this game despite everything I mentioned, more power to you. I saw some extremely positive thoughts when the game was released, and I'm aware that my majorly negative opinion is not a consensus. Part of me thinks that some people might have been in a honeymoon phase because Danganronpa came back from the dead, but it would be unfair to regard the reception as just that. I hope my complaints resonated with at least some people, and that a future installment falls more in line with what I want from a game like this. I don't think it's unreasonable to hope that a detective game that puts so much focus on the individual mysteries would have far more compelling mysteries, to want it to be internally consistent, to make the little mysteries contribute to the big picture, to offer actual detective work with no answers falling from the sky, to not treat the player as a slot who cannot retain information for more than 5 minutes, and to break its own mold from time to time to keep things fresh and to not let the player always be many steps ahead. We'll see what the future holds, but that's all I've got to say for now. If anyone watched this whole video, thanks for sticking around and feel free to subscribe if you'd like more 3 hour long ramblings and visual novels.